Joe Rogan Podcast, check it out. The Joe Rogan Experience. Train by day, Joe Rogan Podcast by night, all day. Hello, David. How are you, <laughs> What's Joe? happening? Good to see you. Good to see you. How you been? Good to see you're still alive. <laughs> you're not full of visible holes. Not come void. <laughs> <laughs> what have you been up to, man? Um, spending a lot of time with my daughter, uh, number one. And then number two, I've been working on this series for National Geographic. So I've been traveling around the world searching for these people that do incredible feats that they've passed down through generations and I'm trying to learn but it's a fast learning curve so it is the most dangerous thing that I've ever done in my life but I have the best of the best helping so that says a lot because you've done by far the most yes whoa well you showed me some things off camera that we can't talk about but well you can talk about them I just can't show them Okay. okay Well, um, so the scariest thing was like three days ago. I, I the kissed cobra? a king cobra. Yeah, I saw in that. the wild. Yeah, <laughs> what is is there a trick to that? Is there a, a, is it a movement thing? Do you move slowly so you don't? I studied for weeks and just tried to understand their behavior, and worked with different cobras and and was. I had a team around me that that taught me how to move quickly and get out of the way. What happens if you get bit? Well, they have enough venom to kill a full-grown elephant in 30 minutes. So is we had an anti-venom. Venom? We had that there, but but still, in my case, I don't trust that. And even if you get anti-venom, it's still a rough ride. Even yeah, if you live right. <laughs> yeah, is it similar? But it was to, amazing. It was incredible. Is it like, similar to rattlesnake venom? Because rattlesnake venom essentially, it's like, a neuro, Yeah, I mean, it digests it, your body. Well, this this one. It, shuts everything down so mm. your heart your lungs everything just start to so were they like ready on standby with a needle well they don't they put it in a serum you have to go to a hospital oh we you had to go to a hospital yeah so you have to travel but we had an ambulance right there and how far is the hospital it was 20 minutes away oh god so 20 in minutes Thailand. of king <laughs> oh god so 20 minutes of king cobra venom it was the scariest elephant. and most intense thing i've ever done yeah. <laughs> How many of these guys die doing this? Well, the the snake we the two snakes we had, one of them killed its previous uh, previous owner. Oh boy. Yeah. And so they don't kill scary. the snake after it kills the previous oh, owner. No. This guy died, so it yeah, Exactly. Happen. Right. That's right. Oh yeah. boy. Yeah, it's it's but it is kind of incredible cuz there's another guy named Chris Sweet who, um, well, that's his Instagram name, but he lives in Thailand with 90 venomous snakes, and he just lets them move through his legs. Through he's Well, he was bitten twice on my birthday, and his heart stopped two times. But he lets them just While move. you were there? No. Oh, okay. No, no, no. On April 4th, I mean. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. But, he, but he's so calm with them, and he studies their behavior, and he watches how they move, and then he gently takes them out. And there was one, we were outside, and the scariest thing wasn't trying to this kiss it. Yeah, oh exactly. Yeah. And Look I think that's that a snake thing. called a spire. Yeah, so that, that's one that was slithering through my legs. And you have to keep your heart rate down. Because if they sense, they have pheromones. They detect if you're nervous or uncomfortable. So anytime I would get like super tense, I would have to. I'd walk away carefully. <laughs> but, oh boy! Yeah, that's him. And that's yep. That's a snake called a spire. It has. You're a name. so good at finding everything. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Oh my God! It's trying to bite you through the glass. <laughs> Why is it trying to bite you through the glass, but won't try to bite you when you're right there? Well, there it's feeding. Oh, when it smells snake or food, it becomes aggressive. So you have to make sure you don't smell like any other snakes or anything. Or food. What kind of food? They eat snakes, the king cobras. They eat other snakes. Yeah. Not king cobras, but other snakes. But other snakes. Yeah. Dude. Okay. <laughs> do you ever second guess when you're about to do something like that this? That one like, I second guessed. I, yeah. left, I left and then came back a few months later and did it again. I wouldn't go. Oh, I was boy. too afraid to go near it. What made you go back? Well, I went to Cleveland and I trained with my friend Mike, 
and my other friend, Chris Gillette, who's Gator Boy Chris, who's amazing. And we slowly started to understand just a little bit of the behavior of king cobras. And then I went back to Indonesia and trained with Fitz, who's unbelievable with how he handles the cobras. And slowly I felt okay. But there was days I wouldn't even do anything. <sighs> so luckily I had a week, which is still a really fast learning curve. Yeah. <laughs> Normally I would train for something for a year, but with this show I get like a few days and then I have to try to do it. Oh boy. So what strategies are you using to keep your heart rate low? Like when if you feel yourself freaking out, how do you calm yourself down? I, I get out. You just get out. Yeah. Yeah, just get out and regroup. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <Whoa>. David. <laughs> But that's the last dangerous thing I'm going to do like that. Ever. That's it. Ever. Yeah. 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 Like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm glad you're alive. And, you and I feel like in my, I did it in my show in Vegas. I was jumping from uh, like the height of a nine story building, landing in boxes, and I dislocated my shoulder. It came down to my armpit. <sighs> it, but in retrospect, I think I was lucky because that could have been really bad. It could have been the neck. It could have been something else. Oh, yeah. So, did you get surgery? No, I didn't get the surgery. What they did? Just pop. It there back was an in orthopedic place? surgeons convention in Vegas at that time, so I had five orthopedic surgeons in the office in the audience, and one was a shoulder specialist, and he they all came on stage and they and he popped it right back in. <laughs> so then I walked out to do the show, Joe, with but but I, I my arm was all numb. It stayed numb for like two months, but I was going like this to get like to see if I could get feeling back, and it fell back out. So oh, I had to go God. back on stage. They popped it back in, and then I did the whole show with one arm. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's a bad one. I think that's when oh. I got injured. Yeah. And my friend Doug, who's with the hat right there, he when I jumped, he knew that something was going to go wrong. He bent over and took a heavy breath because he knew that was the one. There's a, a gentleman named Yuri Prohaska. He was the UFC light heavyweight champion. And his shoulder dislocated during training. And his trainers tried to pop it back into place, and they were yanking on it, and they just destroyed his shoulder. They tore everything apart, just kind of pulling on it, and it ripped apart. They, the UFC doctor said it was the worst shoulder injury he'd ever seen. That's crazy. And he's fighting again next weekend. <laughs> got it repaired. He got surgery? Yep, got surgery, vacated his title, and now he's back fighting for the title next weekend. Hmm. Yeah, mine is still messed up. Really? Yeah. Like in what way? Well, I haven't. I can't really work out or do anything the same. How long way. ago? Uh, maybe March. Did you get an MRI? Oh, many MRIs. What is, what's the damage? No, it was really bad. I ripped in the there? ligaments. I t it was bad. It came down to here. Right. Why didn't they yeah. do surgery? I didn't. I'm like afraid of surgery, I have to say. Like horrified of it. Why are you afraid of surgery? I don't know. I You're just not think... afraid of King Cobra's view? <laughs> yeah, it's crazy, but I'm horrified of surgery. Why? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you should probably get surgery. Um, what, like specifically, which which uh, ligaments? I have a lot of experience with this stuff. Uh, I have all the scans and the whole write-up of it, mm -hmm. so I could show it to you. Uh, and so it's just very weak and it's uh, not well, stable? Can't yeah, it just hurts. Overhead. No, I, I can go overhead. So mm -hmm. I'm good like that. It's just hard to like push things. Uh, no, I can still do it, but not like I used to. Have you ever gotten stem cells? No. You should get stem cell therapy on it. That could help a lot. I avoided surgery completely with stem cells. Really? Yeah, I had a full length rotator cuff tear in my right shoulder. It went away. The doctor said it was extraordinary. He went to look at it six months later, and the, the tear was completely gone. He said, This is insane. And this wow. is just, yeah, they can do wild stuff. How did you stuff. rip your rotator cuff? Training, just jujitsu. Like too hard? I don't know. But it was a slow or it was a one time you uh, it? It was, you know, jujitsu's it's very addictive and a lot of times you get injured and you're like, ah, I still can roll. I'm gonna go back in. <laughs> and you go back in with like fucked up discs and a tweaked knee and a fucked up shoulder and I know a lot of guys that have some pretty significant injuries and they just can't stop training. They just enjoy right. it so much. Right. Um stem cells could help you a lot. Specifically, if you go out of the country, because they can do some wild shit that they can't do in America because of the FDA. I have some good friends that run a clinic in Tijuana. It's called uh, CPI, and a bunch of my friends have gone down there, a bunch of UFC fighters, 
it'd help you a lot. I'd be so afraid, though. Why? I don't know. Why are you talking about being afraid of that? I don't know. That? Maybe because <laughs> when I was young and my mother was sick and, you know, that that whole thing, maybe. Mm. Well, this, this is... Uh, what they can do with modern stem cells is pretty extraordinary. Mm. But unfortunately, the United States is very limited in what you can get away with here. Right. Yeah. They, they're constantly putting restrictions on it, unfortunately, for no reason. You know, it doesn't, mm. it doesn't make any sense. The, the, there's no downsides. I feel like also just when I eat right and, and, and do everything perfectly, the inflammation all goes away. For sure. And then the pain goes away and it's much better. So. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. That, that's definitely a factor. Yeah, inflammation is huge. It's yeah. a, and a lot of it does come from bad food. A lot of it comes from too much sugar, too much bread, yeah. pasta, that kind of shit, ice cream, all that shit, <laughs> all the stuff that's good. <laughs> but yeah, I'll, afterwards I'll connect you with those people. Okay. Yeah, I bet um, it can help you a lot. And it doesn't hurt. I mean, oh, really? No, There's no downside? It's, no, it's not going to hurt you. No. No, you'll go there. They'll, what they'll do is they'll do uh, IV stem cells. They'll do local stem cells into whatever the area that's injured, and then they'll use hyperbaric chambers, which also accelerates the healing. They'll have you down there for a few days, and uh, I, I guarantee you, a few months later, you'll feel significantly better. Wow. Yeah, that is all dependent upon what structural issues you have. Now, if you have I something that's really, completely it was torn. Severe off the bone and it's not connected anymore, they can't help with that. I don't think it's that bad because I can already do this. Mm -hmm. Sometimes so. you can do that even though it's torn because there are other ligaments that compensate right. and other muscles that compensate. And I still have a little bit of numbness down here, by the way. Yeah. But it was really crazy because I was numb all the way to here for, mm -hmm. for like months. Yeah, that's generally that's nerve damage. It takes a long time for that stuff to, to heal. Nerve damage is rough. But, but I feel like I got off easy. Oh, yeah, it could like have been back... your neck. Yeah, for yes. sure. Right. So yeah. I feel like that was a good lesson. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, not every night. <laughs> don't do it, period. Don't do it again. The if craziest you... thing was we only had insurance for the first 10 shows, and the injury was on the 10th show. Oh, boy. So Monday morning, the insurance company called. They said, do you want to discuss uh, this new condition? <laughs> yeah. So that, that was the end of that. Yeah. Which is a good thing. Yeah, don't do that. You're, uh, you've done some extraordinary things with yourself. I mean, you really have. Some crazy things. Yeah, some crazy <laughs> things. But all for entertainment and not, I mean, it's interesting because it is entertainment, but it's also entertainment and sort of educating people the, the boundaries of what the mind can force the body to do. You know, like the one we did where you're frozen in ice? Yeah. <laughs> like, that's basically just you. Standing. Standing and using breathing <laughs> techniques and your mind to to deal with that situation. How long was that for? I think 63 hours. Yeah. That's a long time. But my brain tweaked at 55 hours. Yeah? Yeah. Were you, well, you probably weren't sleeping, right? No, you can't. Right. So there, probably a lot of the brain tweaking is just from that. Yeah. Wouldn't you imagine? I, I think that plus the extreme... Yeah. yeah, extreme cold and lack of sleep, and you're standing up. Standing, and I had edema. My ankles had blown oh, up. Oh, I could imagine. Oh, yeah. Yeah. How long did it take you to recover from that? Uh, a while. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> I couldn't even walk for a while. <laughs> oh, David. <laughs> but I was lucky because it was a 68-degree November, so the air pumping through was 68 degrees. So it created that drip that was awful from the ice, but... That that helps significantly. I well, think. even just standing still for yeah. See how happy hours. I am. Yeah, you look super happy. <laughs> You're probably hallucinating. <laughs> that does look like the begin. That's hallucination right there. Yeah. That's where I'm hallucinating. What did you see? Um, everything. Like I what? Mean, my mother was in the ice talking to me. Wow. Then my girlfriend was in the ice talking to me, and uh, time moved completely different. It was crazy. Whoa. But. Kind of amazing at the same time. Wow. Yeah, but, but kind of horrific. I can imagine. The way I explained it was like having nightmares with my eyes open. Wow. I think your brain is doing anything it can to trick you to try to quit so you can go to sleep. Considering all the things you've done, you're in remarkably good condition. 
Uh, uh, time will tell. But I mean, you're hope- walking around, you're right. talking, <laughs> everything's fine. I mean, <laughs> hopefully you're right. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm always pushing it. No, no, I'm always concerned about the uh, the 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 effects. You know. Yeah, I would imagine. Yeah. Something to be concerned about. Yeah, because I want now that I have a daughter, I want to live long. You know? Sure. I want to live yeah. till I'm a hundred. <laughs> right. That's possible if you don't get bit by a cobra. <laughs> it's totally possible. Then now is probably the best time ever to have to that stop goal. Over. <laughs> well, I mean, to have the goal of living to 100 with modern science and medicine. Yeah, I believe it's possible. Well, it's for um, people who live to 100. But I think diet is everything. It's a lot of it. Yeah. Are you, are you uh, pretty diligent with your diet? Well, since the injury kind of gave me an excuse to not be, but I need to... Get serious. Again. The injury gave you an excuse to not be? Yeah. How come? <laughs> I don't know. I was like, fuck this. You know? uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. No, if you, I mean, it seems simple, but it is true that your body is essentially made out of what you consume. Yeah. It's the only thing that it has to For regenerate. Sure. And yep. it doesn't, people don't think of it that way. You think of your body as your body, but nope. your body is constantly reproducing itself. Cells yep. are constantly re- regenerating. Yep. And if you don't give your body good nutrients and real food, you suffer. You suffer. And that is the majority of Americans, unfortunately. Even my friend is running a marathon in a few days. And I said, for the next couple of days, reduce any food that, that will give you inflammation and do extreme hydration. Because yeah. the impact of, of that distance mm-hmm. will pay its toll in the long run. Most certainly. Especially if you're not conditioned for it. And I think really good endurance athletes like, you know, Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan, LeBron James, Tom Brady, they all are very concerned with inflammation. Oh, yeah. So they don't have anything that will give them inflammation. And I think that allows you to to, to continue much longer. Most certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, inflammation is one of the biggest problems that people have, particularly in this country, because the way we eat. I'm sure you've seen those photographs of people on the beach in like the 1960s versus people on the beach in 2023. No, but I can imagine. Yeah, we're we've ballooned, and it's because of the American diet. Yeah, it's It's sugar. uh, It's sugar and the process, the bad sugars. Mm -hmm. Yep. And even just the way they genetically modified fruit, like if you look at watermelon from the Renaissance days, like a Renaissance painting of a watermelon, mm-hmm. as opposed to a watermelon now, there it doesn't even look like the same thing. Right. It yields such a high dose of sugar to become addictive. So you can, yeah. And berries, everything. So. Yeah, that term genetically modified gets thrown around a lot. A lot of it is just selective breeding. You know, like they, they just sure. figure out a way to – breeding is not the right word either. Uh, it's like they – they select for very specific traits. I mean, that's why they've made a tomato that can sit on a, a truck and drive across the country and not rot, you know. But then you get it and it's flavorless and pale. Yeah. But it's durable. Wait, can can you pull up a Renaissance painting of a watermelon? I just want you to see. Yeah. It. I've never, and I don't think I've ever seen side a by side. Renaissance it's painting of a watermelon. Yeah, how they were before, originally. Well, you, I'm sure you've seen like heirloom tomatoes. Have you seen heirloom tomatoes? Yeah. They look so. Oh, that's see? What like. Whoa. And wait, the middle left one. Sh- no, le- yeah, that one shows the. the Both see of them. the difference? Wow. Yeah, they've done that with everything. <laughs> That's wild. Yeah, it's all. I mean, it, it's a reason. That I think even fruit. You would think fruit is so healthy, but then you get these berries when you go to Whole Foods, and they're like this big, and they're so juicy, and you eat the whole thing. Mm-hmm. But if you're in the wild, getting blackberries, they're small, they're bitter. So, mm-hmm. yeah, that's extraordinary. So I think even the fruit and the things we think are healthy, we have to be careful. Yeah, yeah. it's definitely very different. <laughs> but I don't necessarily think. I think. I wonder, like, what is the difference in terms of the nutrient content, whether or not it's bad for you to eat modern watermelon. I would doubt it is. No, I think it's fine, it does... but I'm just saying it yields such a high dose of sugar. Right. Yeah. yeah. And Most sugar certainly. creates inflammation. Yeah, it certainly does. If... And, and cancer thrives on... Mm-hmm. You know, so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, it, I've noticed a giant difference cutting sugar out of my life, like, when, when I cut it out and just live uh, very cleanly, eat very cleanly. It's just massive difference in how your body feels, how your back feels, joints it, feel, that's, everything. It, especially things like the back. And like where brain. you have pain, mm-hmm. that stuff goes away. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. even how your brain functions. Everything. Yeah. Yeah. 
right now my brain is on a lag because I've been not eating properly. Uh, <laughs> I would think if anybody would be taking care of themselves, it's someone like you that yeah, I need to. brutalizes yourself. <laughs> but sometimes yeah. I go so extreme that I need like a, a break and I go the other way. I know what you mean. Yeah, you get tired of it. That happens to a lot of fighters. They get done fighting and they just get fat because they're just like, I don't want to train anymore. I don't want to do anything. Yeah, because they're so extreme and yeah. so focused, and all yeah. of a sudden it's a. <laughs> yeah, I think little vacations from discipline are fine, but I, when I take a little vacation from discipline, I feel like shit, and then I'm like, "What are you doing?" And then I'm upset with myself, and then I go back the way I used to eat, and I'm fine. And then you feel great. Yeah, yeah. but that's you know, it's what humans are supposed to eat. We're we're supposed to eat real food, and a giant percentage of our diet is processed bullshit, and that stuff is just. It tastes good and it tricks your body because there's all sorts of salt and sugar in it. And, you know, those high calorie, high carbohydrate foods are so easy to overconsume. Yeah. You know, we had, uh, Elon and I had pizza the other night and I just couldn't stop eating it. Jamie had to take it away from me. <laughs> if you didn't take it away from me, I would have ate that whole box. <laughs> yeah, once you start, you oh, can't, I can't stop. stop. I yeah. can't, I'm a glutton. And then the funny thing is then you're still hungry an hour later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas when you eat foods with high nutrition like broccoli or something, you're full. Well, especially protein. If you eat foods, protein has a very high satiety rate. So, like, if you eat steak, you can only eat so much steak. Or you could keep going if you wanted to, if you're in a contest or some shit. Like, you ever see those places like restaurants where they'll – they give you a free meal if you could eat a 72-ounce steak. And so <laughs> people try to eat them. You have to eat it like within 30 minutes or something crazy like that. Um, but when you eat steak, like at a certain level, you'll, you're will you done. Your body's like, that's enough. But if there's steak and then bread, the bread's right there with butter and it smells good and it's fresh. Oh, ooh, give me some more of that bread. Or there's a bowl of pasta. Like, ooh, and then there's some ice cream. Ooh, <laughs> you'll keep going. And that's... That's where modern foods have kind of hijacked the, the human brain, yeah. hijacked your reward system. It makes you crave these things that are ultimately detrimental to your health. But when you're eating really healthy, what's your diet? Mostly meat. I eat mostly meat and eggs. Do you eat raw yeah. eggs? No. No, I cook them. I, mean, I feel so good when I have raw eggs. They're good, but you do have to be concerned with salmonella. You particularly have but to I think be it's like one in 35,000, and it's on the yeah. shell. I think it's a low risk. It's a low risk, yeah. But it does happen. There's a certain percentage of people every year, a certain number of people every year that get salmonella from eggs. But the eggs in Paris, by the way, they're, they taste so good. It's kind of amazing. Well, they're probably free-range chickens. Yeah, and they're that's like, the difference. And they, they're like orange. orange. Yeah. 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 Well, that's a free-range chicken. That's chicken that needs eating bugs and worms and small rodents and things like that, which is what they're – I mean, they're fucking dinosaurs. I have chickens. And the chickens that you have, if you have, like, chickens in your, your yard, if you have a good amount of place for them to roam and free-range, they, they that, you get a dark orange yolk, and it's delicious. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. And, and they, it's, it it's also so if you're different. a person who's very – Concerned about uh, factory farming and ethics that are involved in that kind of stuff, and you don't want to eat eggs because the chickens are mistreated. Chickens that you have yourself are basically pets that give you free karma free food because, you know, they're not even scared of you. They wander around you and peck at the ground right near your feet. And they eat ticks too, yeah, right? And <laughs> they will produce food for you because they're not going to make chickens unless there's a rooster. Their, their, their eggs are yeah. never going to fertilize, so you're getting these beautiful, healthy perfect. eggs. Yeah, that's and amazing. no one loses. No. Yeah, it's a perfect cycle. And they taste cycle. so – and they're yeah. – yeah. It's so good for you. And there's so many things that you can get from eggs that you're just not going to get from a plant-based diet. Unless you're supplementing, you're just not going to get them. Do you take vitamins? Yeah, yeah. I take those liposol the the liquid ones because you absorb them. Liposomal, yeah. yeah, those ones. But yeah. I was gonna bring them and and share them with you, but I forgot. <laughs> yeah, I take those. I also take uh, you know what uh, AG one is, Athletic Greens. No, it's great. It's just very simple. You take a scoop of it, put it in some water, stir it up, and it's probiotics. It's like seventy five different vitamins and nutrients. Very good. It tastes good. Easy. So simple. Just stir it up. It's called AG1? AG1. Yeah, it's very easy because it's like, it's a no-brainer. They sell little travel packs. Just open up a bottle of water, pour it in the bottle of water, shake it up, drink it. And great. it's all natural? All natural, yeah. Hmm. It's all plant-based yeah, stuff. Yeah, that I'll look into. It's great. There's, and then, you know, you really should supplement with vitamin D. 
um, uh, you know, vitamin D and K2, they work well together. But all that stuff is one of the things that people are very deficient in. Yeah. D- vitamin D in particular. It's a big one, particularly in cold climates where people don't go outside very much. You don't get exposure to sun. The best way to get vitamin D is from the sun. Natural, yeah. Yeah, that's the best way. But most people do not get enough. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. We're indoor all day working. Yeah, but when you think about, like, what did human beings eat to thrive? Well, the, the their most treasured and the, their prized food was meat. If they could kill a deer, if they could kill, you know, something that was nutrient dense, that had fat on it, a pig, like that's what they, they che- treasured the most because that's what they would give them the most nutrients. But you would also assume they would have like coconuts, bananas. Sure. And fruits. Fruits good. That were easy. To Especially, have. I mean, again, fruits that weren't fucked with. But that's one of the things that we've done with wheat. You know, if you get wheat, I mean, everybody talks about this. If you get wheat in Europe, you're getting this heirloom wheat. You're getting wheat that is really what it was originally when they took wheat and changed it in America. What to they've done is the high dose. Exactly. They destroyed it. Much more it. complex glutens in yep. it and it just gives you more inflammation. And it's harder to digest. Yep. And you mm-hmm. and you don't gain weight from those I know. non-modified seeds of 500 years ago. I know. You yet. go to Europe and you eat their food. You look at them. They're not fat. No. It's crazy. It, look yeah. at France. The people eating bread in France. They yeah. eat bread every day. They're not fat. Nope. In America, we're all balloons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just in making things better to sell because the higher yield and, you know, you can you can make more profit. You, we've poisoned ourselves. Yeah. Essentially. You know? Yeah. It's fucked. <laughs> but at least we know it. So if you do seek out the information, there's plenty of doctors that could explain these things to you and just seek out organic foods and, and just eat real foods. Eat real foods. And that you'll you'll be far better off. You even sleep better. I oh, don't yeah. I don't snore. Oh, yeah. I don't need as much sleep. Sure. It, it's 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 so crazy what a difference it makes Mm -hmm. it does it makes a giant difference (laughs) and it's so hard to get people to deviate because uh, once you get accustomed to eating certain kinds of food and you start craving those kinds of food yeah it just triggers your uh... difficult to get off that path (laughs) 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 yeah so we'll we get your shoulders sorted out (laughs) <laughs> I'd like to see what your MRI said, though, too. Yeah, and I'll, I'm sure they'll, 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 they'll want the doctors the, want to see that, too. Yeah, if I have all yeah. the MRI. So I was doing MRIs before every jump and after every jump just to make sure the blood vessels around the heart, you know, things weren't oh, yeah. shifting because if we noticed something small, then we would stop because that way the blood, something connected to the heart wouldn't yeah. become problematic. So, yeah. yeah. I feel like I got lucky on that. You probably definitely did because if it hit your neck and had the same sort of impact with what it did to your shoulder. Imagine something that can blow out your shoulder like that, what it could do to your spinal cord. Yep. You know? Yeah. Very dangerous. Yeah. Do you ever think you're going to stop doing this kind of crazy shit? I think so. Really? Yeah, I think I'll eventually just move towards magic only. (laughs) Well, you're really good at magic, too. (laughs) That's what's so confusing to me. Your card tricks are fucking bizarre. Like when you uh, you did a bunch of card tricks for us off air. You did them for my kids. You did them for the security guys at the old studio in L.A. And I mean, Jamie is like really good at watching that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah, I've been watching him since I was younger. Right, but so Jamie I love was watching this shit. Jamie was fucking staring at you like a hawk. I want to figure it out. I yeah. mean, I know it's magic, but like, there's also that was tricks. Yeah, he knows how to do it. Yeah, he didn't but, always know how to do it. But after it was done, Jamie was like, "Fuck, I have no fucking idea." I tried. I thought I knew what was going to happen. Yeah, and I didn't. Yeah, or you're, with the, you're obviously that good. So. He couldn't wait though. He was like, "I'm going to fucking watch everything. I'm going to I'm going to figure it out." He couldn't figure out jack shit. It's um, yeah, that alone. But I mean, you're kind of the only magician who also does things that aren't necessarily magic, but they are extraordinary feats. Of control of your body and just dangerous stunts. I think part of the excitement for me is just learning something that's unique, that that's not really done in the magic world, but then just the actual training and learning a new skill. So it's like a continual search to try to figure out new things. And that's kind of what keeps me excited in a lot of ways. Mm. And I think it's like something different because uh, 
I think mo most people that are magicians, they you know, a card trick everybody can learn, but when you when you go and try to figure out one of those things that are insane to learn or, or you're inspired by something else and it leads to the trick itself that that's exciting for me mm. so when I went to Africa to learn how to swallow a gallon of water and then spout it out I didn't know it would lead to being able to hold frogs in my stomach and then produce them at any time but it ended up leading to that so it became a magic trick but it started as like some insane skill that I saw somebody do and I was obsessed with when you swallow a gallon of water, are you stretching your stomach out? Is yeah, that what's it's happening? It's awful. But is it like do you yes. gain greater capacity because of that? Uh, no. No? It's, no. Every night in my show, I have to put a gallon of water inside, and it's horrible. What does it feel like? Ugh, awful. Like pregnancy, maybe? I don't know. I can't answer. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I'm not but sure. <laughs> something, so you feel your organs stretching? Do you feel like everything getting pushed aside? To make room for the water? I mean, a gallon of water is... Is a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. What does it weigh? Uh, I think like 8.43 pounds or something like that. Yeah. yeah. So just imagine eight pounds of food. It might be 8.34 or 4. Just I'm eight pounds sure. of food in your body is insane. Yeah. No, you it's know? a lot. And Sitting it's down eating, And it's all solid. Yeah. It's water. So it's Ugh. just like a big... So just a mass in there. It, and then I have to go do the show. Oh, God. So you Every have night. it in your body yes. while you're doing that. So you have to ignore this awful feeling. While you're doing your show. And act normal. Whoa. And then <laughs> spit it all out. How do you make sure you're not peeing it all out? Like, how do you... I know the time on that. So oh. I've practiced the window of time. Of What's the window long? of time between well, swallowing it? Starts, and... you, it, it? Obviously, it starts to move in like 15 minutes. But I'm able to kind of control it for the length of the show. Pretty much. Are you contracting your body? Are you doing something physically? Well, then I spout it out to put out the fire. Right. So it's a break, and then I reload it. So secretly. <laughs> 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 so when you spout it out to put out the fire, people are like, "What the fuck? Like, where did you get all this water?" Well, they see me drinking it also. Some. So, right. Yeah. But still. <laughs> It's pretty insane. It's insane. It's a show that, you know, my show is a show that you can only do like once or twice a month. You can't do it right. If I did a card trick show, I could do it every night, right? right. It'd be like very good for business. Yeah. <laughs> but I like this show because it's an impossible show. It's like one that I have to like get into the mindset and be like, oh, fuck. Here comes so, another night. <laughs> so when you put together a show like this, like when you're sitting down in the planning stages and you're like, okay. Got a big show coming up in Vegas. What am I going to do? How much time is involved in the creation of something like this? Years. Years. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, years and years. Wow. I mean, it took me 20 years to even do my show. 20 years. Almost. That's 15, insane. 20, yeah. Because I wanted something that was different and, uh, you know, something that I felt like would represent what I love and what interests me. So I worked on all these crazy things and it took so long to figure them out and then how to apply magic to them. Mm. Like how to make the, the trick part. And then the trick part always makes the other thing seem like that's a trick. So uh, when I'm holding my breath, everybody thinks like I have tubes or something. <laughs> right, 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 right. What did you do when you held your breath? Like how long did you hold it for? It was well, something insane. Like I want to say like my actual, 13 minutes or something like that. I did 1704 on, o on Oprah. But my actual record with doctors and pulmonary experts and all that was 20 minutes and two seconds, breathing pure O2. And my heart rate dropped to eight beats per minute. So they pulled me up because they thought I was going to go into cardiac arrest. And I actually, that one felt pretty good. But now I think the record is like 2403. Wow. Yeah. And what do you, you're, you're breathing pure oxygen yeah. before you do it. Yeah, without the pure two, I was up to like 747. Which is still insane. I know free divers can do stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. But they're also, the ones that are really good are really thin, really tall. They have a, a, a total lung capacity that's much greater than mine. Mine is less than average. So Your lung capacity yeah. is less than average? Yeah, 80% of the average person my height and size. Why is that? I don't know. That doesn't even make sense if you can hold your yeah, breath that TLC long. Yeah, TLC is 80% of the... Hmm, that's crazy. But I think that's where it, a lot of it has to do with accepting the pain, like mind over matter. So know? generally like taller, longer people it have makes longer it lungs. Yeah, bigger, the, lo yeah. Yeah, bigger chest cavity. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. 
there was a dude who was an MMA fighter named Egan Inouye, and I know he did something insane. He was a free diver. He lived in Hawaii, and I think I think he was up to like seven plus minutes, and that's also physical, right? Because you're you're holding your breath, and then you're diving into the water and moving your body, so that Makes consumes it much harder oxygen. It's not just sitting there. Yeah, yeah. When I was doing it, I was I just and even your brain functioning, you want to shut everything down because your brain uses a lot of oxygen as well. Ooh. So the more that you can just that. shut everything down, the more efficient you are. And when you're doing that, like, how are you getting your heart rate to eight beats a minute? I didn't intentionally do that. It just happened. I think the body does does whatever it needs to do to make sure you survive. Right. So your body's recognizing, like, this motherfucker isn't breathing. Yeah. Let's just slow it down. And, like, yeah. it's kind of like creeping towards the gas station when you're on E. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like, you're going, like, five <laughs> miles an hour because you know you're not going to make it otherwise. <laughs> wow. What do you think is the most difficult of all these things you've ever done? Um, maybe the ice. Is mm. hard. Just on the mind. Yeah, that one was the worst one. I would never do that again. How long did it take your brain to recover from that? The did brain recovers... Uh, Pretty fast. I think after one night's sleep, I was okay. Really? The brain, yeah. So no more hallucinations. Yeah, but also I was, I was, yeah, it was, it was bad. I would worry about something like that that I would open up a door that I could never close. Yeah, that would like, be that horrible. would be like in a in a horror movie that would happen. That's like why you, I don't mess with sleep deprivation. I tried to mess to with the it. underworld. It's, yeah, it's scary. Yeah, I think it's a very effective form of torture i think in north korea they did that to the americans extreme sleep deprivation i think that tweaked them the, the worst oh i'm sure we do it too yeah guantanamo <laughs> bay yeah I sleep mean, deprivation is horrific yeah isn't it crazy it's horrible because that's one you wouldn't even think of as torture and when you think of people think of as torture <laughs> they think of pain you know they don't think of just like making someone stay awake well the, but that's isn't that chinese water torture they just drip water in your face i don't think that one's so bad Really? I don't think so. I heard it's pretty bad. I don't I know. I think there's something about it that just keeps you awake, and it's just nuts because you're just the drip and, like, it being but irregular you get, intervals. Maybe you get micro sleep. Yeah. I don't know. I don't <laughs> think so. Maybe you should try that one. Do you want to see this trick? I would love to see this trick. <laughs> what do you got? Well, it's a simple one, but it's a new okay. one. So I just used some thread, but I might need your help. Okay. Um, do you want to come closer? Okay. I'll come over there. Yeah. Should I, I can move. Should I move over, or you can come here? I'll come over there. Should I slide to the left or something? So first, I'll show you the trick version. Wait, okay. can I take this off? Yeah. So first, I'll show you the trick version of it. Okay. Which is just like this. For the people just listening at home, uh, he folded over a little loop in a String. piece of thread. Yeah. And he's putting it in his mouth and swallowing it. He's chewing on the thread. Now he's drinking water. Yeah, I think it's... Here, wait. So this is a trick version. You see, you get, um, see, you can pull. Here, I don't know if you can see. Can you, do you want to just pull it? Pull the thread? So yeah. you have a thread that you yeah, stuck pull it. in your body. See? Uh -huh. So that's the trick version. That's a thread that he just had embedded in his skin. But hold on, here's a different version. Hold on. Actually, right. I'll do. Instead, instead, I'll do it this way, so you can see what's okay. actually happening. Here, wait. Let me. Mm. Yeah, will you grab here? The one the under your chin. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so now he's got a thread coming yeah, out yeah, from uh, under his yeah, chin. I pulled up a little. Okay. Uh, pull it down. 
It's uh, through his mouth and through the bottom of his mouth and mm. out his chin. And pull. Want to pull it out? Yeah. Okay. So that's something that I learned in India. <laughs> so you just essentially use a needle and shove it through the bottom of your jaw. <laughs> and, and people think it's coming out of your mouth. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty good though. It is pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna go to the other side. <laughs> so it's uh there's a there's a book called Swami Mantra. And how are you getting it into your chest? You well there's oh, first I'll tell you there's a book called Swami Mantra, which is a collection of pamphlets of secrets of what the fakirs are doing in India. So th- there was a trick that I saw a magician do when I was a kid. And he ate a thread and he pulled it out of his stomach. And I was with a bunch of amazing magicians and we were all blown away and in shock. Right. But I cornered the guy and convinced him to teach me the secret. So then I, I started playing with it. And, and then just now when I was in India meeting street magicians and finding all these performers, I went to a festival. And they do all of these extreme things I have never seen before. Like they push the the ice pick skewer type thing mm-hmm. through their neck through their me- and so i suddenly had an idea and i was like wait maybe there's a way and then <laughs> yeah <laughs> and then the it way. becomes a magic trick but you're seeing the early phase of of it okay yeah sometimes i get nervous that like uh you know obviously anything could go wrong you could you know yeah but, start yeah. squirting blood <laughs> like it happened last time. Yeah. <laughs> well, last I time, promised you there was going to be no blood. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> when last time we poked the ice pick through your arm, we hit a nerve, right? We had to back it out and do it. Oh, again. yeah. And it, it was, was not good. Inter- yeah, and it bubbled up. Yeah, yeah, not good. Yeah. I was not. That's not what I wanted to happen. Yeah. I was traumatized afterwards. I was like, oh, f- I'm fucked. You just pick. So is that just a a luck thing? Like you miss, or you just don't know exactly where to push it through? No. What happened was normally I I think I go in from this side and out, uh-huh. but because you were sitting here and I wanted you to push it, I think we went in the opposite direction. Oh. And I think it that's what went wrong. Oh, so you know where to do it normally? No, I, there's a lot of space to do it. So there's like you know. But from the other side, I don't really know. And I, oh, for some reason, I thought it would be okay. But <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Well, how long did that one take to heal up from? I mean, that was fine because it was just the arm. It just wasn't like blood. it wasn't nerve or anything. Yeah. It yeah. seemed like you were hitting nerve, though. Well, we stopped and we yeah. started again, didn't we? Did we start and stop? Yeah, again? yeah we stopped yeah. and we, we found a new hole <laughs> and we tried again. <laughs> Yeah, but it was bleeding internally, mm. Bal- ballooning up, and we had to stop the show. And you had to get. Luckily, we had an EMT here. <laughs> yeah, but he he said it was fine. Yeah, and it was. But he was a little bit like, "What the fuck?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah. After I was like, "My career is over. I just did the most disgusting things. Nothing worked. It was horrible." There it is. Yeah. So yeah. Exactly. exactly. I went You're the going through the. Way. That's right. That's, that's what, what went wrong. Yep. Yeah. Yikes. Yep. And I always go in the other direction. What is the difference, though? If it's the same spot, I don't know. Maybe. Obviously. Yeah. Well, I, I think isn't it's probably you know how to do it yourself. Well, no, right. but I let the if audience you... do it when they come on stage. I let them oh, really? pick a spot. Yeah, I, I mean, I make sure it's above the break. You know, I make sure yeah. it's not in a dangerous place. But yeah, yeah. How many times <sighs> you've stuck a ice pick through your arm? Oh my, so many. And through the hand, mo- way more. <laughs> Thousands. <laughs> Thousands. Yes, and through both hands. I had to stop with my hand because I was getting uh, the scar tissue and it was becoming really hard to push the ice. Oh. But I did I did CT scans, I looked at the hand, I studied where all the blood vessels are, so I, I, I thought about it for a long time before I started doing it and then I did it with like acupuncture needle. But this is something nobody should do. I, it, I, no magician, nobody, because it's just real, there's, there's, it's just not good when things go wrong. Yeah, I would imagine. Yeah. I would imagine that's a real problem. <laughs> How do you like decide 
like what you're going to do when with these kind of things like how, what makes you come to like i think i'm gonna stick an ice pick through my hand I think that started early on. There was a magician named Harry Anderson that used to do needle through arm, and it was like a fake arm thing, oh. like a, stuck it together, and it looks like it's going through. And I was like that, and I think I was like that could probably really be done. So I think it began with that, and then I heard about a kid that can take a bicycle spoke and put it through, and then I started thinking, well, if you could do that as a trick but have no blood, then it's kind of amazing and what i didn't realize was basically your blood it coagulates when you so based on time so if you push this through again i don't want to give anybody lessons on how this stuff is not good to do at all but with time i think when you pull it out you just don't bleed unless you go through the wrong side and hit something but yeah (laughs) but i like those things that just seem impossible but there's an actual science to it. Who was the guy who would take thin swords and shove them through his lungs? Yeah, Mirandayo. I, I have not done that, and I don't, I'm don't. i never going to do that. Don't one do that. Yeah, he no. died doing that, didn't he? No. So no? what happened? Uh, well, normally he would have a rapier pushed through by a doctor. And um, he he start and he would go he would jog with these rapiers through his body, through his lungs, right through the middle. And I think what happened was he became very overconfident and thought he could do anything and he swallowed a needle like an ice pick size needle he swallowed it and thought he was going to like push it through and when he went to sleep it was still inside of him and it ruptured his heart and then he bled out and oh died. god yeah yeah i think he started to get so cocky with what his body could do yeah so this is the guy yeah yeah now, how does one do that? I mean, if he's got a... They said a he rib- had tuberculosis, and so it, the, the way his body recovered it, I, it doesn't... Nobody really knows. But I know scientists and doctors, they all thought it wasn't real. They thought it was a trick. So it took forever for them to even think it oh, was real. Oh, it goes real. sideways. Oh, that's right. I forgot this one. So he's going through his fucking intestines. Yeah, he's, oh, he was, he was the human, the human pincushion. <laughs> and that's a doctor? Boy, that doctor... <laughs> <laughs> what about do no harm, fella? That is so insane. So he's got. I mean, it's bandages insane that he could forearms, control. So did it's he go ins- through his arms as well? Is that why his bandages? <laughs> I don't know, but it's insane that he could control it because you know, obviously, when people get stabbed, you and know, now they he's going to do an do X-ray. Is that what he's doing? And look at the holes in oh, his he's back. Got holes all through him. Oh God, dude. Yeah, it's crazy. That guy's got so many holes in yeah, him. Yeah, it's crazy. The doctors have to examine. Yes, it's a and regular that's a sword. Thick rapier, by the way. Yeah, and then they eat. <laughs> <laughs> and like the water comes out. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, don't do that one. Mm-mm. Never. It, it, yeah, there's. I mean, there's real danger in a lot of the shit you do. Well, I, I, but I I don't just go randomly do things. I start. Carefully, methodically, slow. I have not magicians surrounding me. I have doctors, and and I have you know people that are the best in the world that do these things. And I, I there's a slow learning curve. You just never see it. Mm. So, but that one to me, I was like, no, it's not worth the Has risk. Has anybody else done that other than that guy? I don't think so. Not intentionally. <sighs> Stick to cards. <laughs> <laughs> cards are amazing. Why fuck around with the cards? Things? Are amazing. They're amazing. They are amazing. They are amazing. Yeah. Sleight of hand. Yeah, yeah. Skills. Like, yeah, yeah. What's well, the 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 dexterity, the fine mo- mobile skills, motor skills of your fingers? That's it's so impressive. But it makes sense. Like my left hand is so dumb in comparison to my right hand. Like if I try to write things with my right hand or try to tie my shoes. Left-handed, I get well. Actually, you tie your shoes with both fingers, but doing things. It's, One hand is yeah, better, yeah. yeah. Doing things is difficult. Like with your left hand, it just your brain somehow or another doesn't have a really good relationship with your left hand. Yeah, but as a magician, you change that because you have to work with both right. hands equally. So you you definitely rewire the way your fingers move and the way your pinky moves, and you learn to do movements that are not natural well i learned that from boxing because when i first started boxing i'm right-handed and my right hand was so much better than my left hand 
But then after boxing for a few years, my left hand was much better because you use the jab much more than you use the right hand. And my left bicep became larger than my right bicep, like pretty significantly. Wow. Yeah. And Roy Jones Jr. is the best example of that. Roy Jones Jr., when he flexes, like he was in the studio and he flexed, his left bicep is like twice the size of his right bicep. <laughs> because they used to call him Captain Hook because he, he was so fast and so extraordinarily talented that he would throw a left hook the way most people would throw a jab. Just like leap in with this insane fast left hook. And his left bicep was enormous. Look at the size difference. Wow. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, that's a huge difference. Huge difference. And that left hand was a lethal weapon. Amazing. But when when you do box and you throw jabs and left hooks with your left hand and then you switch and try to do it with your right hand, your right hand seems uncoordinated. It's really just your brain has this relationship with those particular movements. Hey, look at his bicep. His wow. Left arm. Was, That's unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, in his prime, he was a, a, just a freak. It's a funny because nobody would think freak. of the jab as being, you know, as... as, as you do you would build your jab much more than a yeah because you use it much more when you're boxing you're constantly throwing jabs and then you occasionally throw right hands it's probably like a four to one ratio at least yeah and then left hooks yeah i used to always print t-shirts when i was a kid of mike tyson <laughs> wear them every day oh yeah <laughs> Yeah, he's he's he, he looks like to me the scariest guy to ever get up against. He's so scary that when uh, he was in my studio, we had a a, a desk. Um, the, so Mike Tyson, the first time he came to the studio, Mike was not fighting. He was completely retired. He, he and he said he wouldn't train because he didn't want to reignite his ego. And then the second time he was in the studio, he had decided to take a fight with Roy Jones Jr. And so uh, he was in his 50s and started training again and got in f fucking insanely dedicated. And the way he, I think he, the way he described, it, he said the gods of war reignited his ego and b brought him back to do combat again. And he was so terrifying that when he was sitting across from me, he was so different between <laughs> the, the first podcast and the second podcast. I decided to make the table wider. I was going to make a more narrow table so I was closer to the people, but I was like, his energy, when I was this close to him, was so, it was so, like, confusing. Man, he is unbelievable. Yeah, that, that's number two. That's when he was back. Yeah, he's my favorite that ever lived. Oh, my he's, God. When in his prime, in the oh, late 80s, he was a fucking force He'd walk out with the black shorts yep, and just no the way socks. he would look. Oh, man. Just the way he right would through people. Yeah. <laughs> He's the scariest heavyweight of all time. He was amazing. Yeah. yeah. Did you see the Francis Ngannou Tyson Fury fight? Mm -mm. Francis Ngannou, who is the UFC heavyweight champion, he uh, vacated the throne and had a, a boxing match with Tyson Fury, who is the lineal heavyweight champion. Dropped him in the third round and won on one judge's scorecard and a loss on the other two. So he lost a majority decision in his first ever boxing match against arguably the best heavyweight boxer. Wow. Absolutely alive, but maybe of all time. You know, it was wow. pretty, pretty, inc and I thought he won the decision. A lot of people thought he won the decision. It's a very close fight. I mean, you could maybe say that Tyson Fury, I mean, you could kind of see an argument that he maybe could have won. On, I don't think so, though. When it comes to damage, I looked at it, I've watched it three times, and in my mind, he won the fight. And I, I think that's one of the most extraordinary accomplishments in combat sports history. A guy who's had zero boxing matches, who is an MMA champion, goes and fights a guy who is one of the greatest boxers that's ever lived. I mean, Tyson Fury is phenomenal. Now, whether Tyson Fury took him seriously, whether he was overconfident, who right. knows? I mean, he literally said to him, time to go to school. I'm taking you to school at the beginning of the fight. And then when Tyson uh, Fury said that, yeah. And then when Francis dropped him in the third round after the fight, Francis is like, "You are a shitty professor." And Francis <laughs> is a real freak. I mean, Francis is six foot five, a natural two hundred and seventy two pounds, and built like a Greek god. Can I see a yeah, Jamie? See if you get the photo of Francis standing over Tyson Fury after he dropped him, because I mean he really rocked him. And by the way, they gave him. I'll send you this, Jamie. They. Uh, 
check the the amount of time that it took for him yeah, to I get up. Like 23 seconds. 23 seconds. So that's after he dropped him. Look how big Francis is. I mean, he's just an extraordinary specimen. And, you know, didn't even start combat sports. He was 25 years old. Where is he from? Cameroon. I mean, we, I had on the podcast, his story is so insane, it is like something from a movie. He was working in the sand mines when he was 10 years old and developed this incredible strength, fucking digging sand. Wow. And when he was a man, decided that he had to leave his village and he wanted to be a professional boxer and wanted to uh, go to Europe. So he walked and made his way to Morocco, like hitched rides and all these different things, made his way to Morocco <laughs> and then seven times traveled on rafts to Europe and got arrested and sent back. And when they would send him back, they would drop him off in the Sahara Desert. That's how they would, would, they would do to people who were trying to make their way to Europe. Wow. And seven times he made his way from the Sahara Desert back to Morocco, back to the raft, and one day finally made his way all the way across, was arrested, was in jail in, in Spain for I think three or four months, and then was homeless in France for a year, found a gym, started training, and they told him to uh, train in MMA. And so he starts training because he wanted to be a boxer, but they were like, you really should be an MMA champion. MMA is a more popular sport now. So he starts training in MMA. Um, four years later, he's the UFC heavyweight champion. I mean, that's crazy. insane. And the guy he knocks out. But it's obviously, it's not just his natural strength, yeah. it's also his willpower. And this, it's, it's, it's everything. It's intelligence. So there's where he drops him. So now when he drops him, so look at the count. One, two, three, four, five. He's up. Six, seven, eight. So he made it up to the count of 10. And he's obviously clearly rocked, takes a big deep breath. But look, it's 12 seconds, 13, 14. The guy's still counting. Seven, eight. This is a bullshit count. And the, the, the referee's still giving him an eight count. And it's 22 seconds before they re-engage. And he, with, the way he hits him is just this clubbing left hook. It's not even like full power from Francis. I mean, he didn't really totally turn. Like Francis is dancing in front of him. <laughs> it comes out of nowhere, though. <laughs> yeah, and then battered him again in the eighth round. And somehow or another, they gave him, they gave uh, Tyson Fury the eighth round on at least one judge's scorecard, which is fucking insane. It might have been two judges. But boxing is a dirty business. It's a dirty sport. I mean, there's always one judge that's in the bag, it seems. Right. At the very least, if they're not absolutely paid off, at the very least, they're deeply indebted to the promoters. And there is some sort of an agenda to right. have this person who's either the most marketable that's or the one who the most is writing on. I mean, I don't think he's going to have a rematch. He didn't talk about a rematch. He didn't say he wanted a rematch. And... To, Francis wants a rematch for sure. Francis thinks he won the fight. It's, I mean, there's, uh, I've, I've, it's interesting. After, you know, uh, the the fight when people it, immediately afterwards, most people were saying that Francis won. After watching it carefully, some people have said they see there there could be an argument that Tyson Fury may have outpointed him. In my mind, Francis landed by far the harder shots. By far, did more damage and. Even though there's this thing that happens when you see an underdog outperform the expectations, which certainly happened. I think he was a 14 to 1 underdog. By the end of the fight, the online betting odds had Francis favored to win, which is crazy. Wow. And then many people, including myself, felt like he did enough to win the decision. I felt he won by at least one round. And um, who's that promoter? Oh, God, I forget his name. The, one who, the guy who promotes Anthony Joshua, Eddie Hearn. He, he gave Francis two rounds. He, he said Francis beat him by two rounds. <coughs> it's uh, just an extraordinary accomplishment. Even losing a majority decision to Tyson Fury is insane. Because the only time this has ever happened before with a, where an MMA champion fought a boxer was when Conor McGregor fought Floyd Mayweather. But Conor McGregor fought Floyd Mayweather when Floyd Mayweather was at the tail end of his career. It was the last bout that Floyd had. And Floyd... Just kind of like wore him out, outboxed him, and stopped him in the fight. Whereas Francis fucking dropped him in the third round and battered him in the eighth round. And it was just an insane performance. I mean, l literally like a legendary combat sports performance. It'll go down in history. When they talk about boxing and things that people have accomplished, it's one of the greatest accomplishments ever. 
pretty but amazing. You train both boxing and yeah, I've MMA done everything. And, yeah. yeah. W- but which do you prefer? MMA for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's more options. It's more complicated. I mean, I think the boxing is an amazing skill. It's an amazing thing to learn. It's it's very helpful in terms of self-defense. It's a, it's an excellent it's a must know it's a, a thing that you must know. If you want to compete in combat sports, you must know how to box. But a really comprehensive skill set that a a true MMA champion will have is far better. And if a boxer, like an elite boxer, fought an MMA fighter, they would have almost no chance. Like if Tyson Fury fought Francis Ngannou in an MMA fight and beat Francis in an MMA fight, that would be more extraordinary than Francis beating or rather than Tyson Fury, uh, or if Tyson Fury beat Francis in an MMA fight, it would be more extraordinary than Francis beating Tyson Fury in a boxing match. Because at least a big part of Francis's skill set is his punching power and his hands. Whereas Tyson Fury has almost no experience in grappling, kicking, any of those skills. If he beat Francis in an MMA fight, that would be like the most incredible thing that anyone's ever done, ever. But no boxer. Other than the only boxer that's ever even like at an elite level competed in MMA was James Tony fought Randy Couture, and he got it was at the end of James Tony's career. He would, he had already accomplished incredible feats as a pure boxer, and kind of just took it for a paycheck, and he got taken down and just strangled pretty quickly. Randy Couture just ankle picked him, brought him to the ground, right. got on top of him, head and arm choked him. It was. It was a, once it got to the ground, it was like a foregone conclusion. Randy was going to destroy him. No boxer has ever said in the middle of their – like if, as if Manny Pacquiao in the middle of his prime said, I'm going to fight MMA. That would be insane. And you'd probably get his face kicked off. I mean probably get strangled, probably get taken down, strangled, and there, he would be helpless. It's a different skill set. There's so much more to MMA. To me, it's more exciting to watch. It's certainly more complicated. It's uh, it, it requires more of you. You have to train in multiple disciplines. You're not just training in using your hands. You're training in kicking, elbows, punches, knees, right. takedowns, submissions, yeah. submission defense. The, the rounds are longer. They're five minute rounds as opposed to three minute rounds. It's like five minutes is a long. It's a time. long time. <laughs> it's a long time. And in the old days, in the Pride day, well, in the old days, of the UFC there was no time limit. And then in the Pride days, which was uh, one of the glory years of MMA in Japan, they would have a 10-minute first round. And, you know, that was very, very hard. That really – Dan Henderson, who was in here before, was one of the all-time greats, said that was what separated the men from the boys, that 10-minute round. Because, you know – 10 lot, minutes of yeah. straight fighting is crazy. Against a train killer. Is crazy. Yeah, in front of the whole world. <laughs> And they would do this at like the Saitama Super Arena, which is like 90,000 people, the Tokyo Dome, these enormous venues. Yeah. But just the endurance training that goes into oh, that insane. is like nothing else. Like nothing else. Like, like not that boxing is not insanely difficult on your endurance as well, especially at a very elite level. It's, I mean, next to wrestling, which is probably one of the most difficult things, it's about as hard a combat sport it exists. But MMA is the top. That's the top. If the, the MMA champion is widely regarded by almost anyone who's an expert as being the baddest man on the planet. That's the, the, whatever weight class it is, the MMA champion, for the most part, is going to dominate someone who is just a boxer. Right. For the most part. You know, but, you know, you've got some guys like Mike Tyson. If someone taught Mike Tyson kicking <laughs> defense and how to take people down, good fucking luck. <laughs> good fucking luck when that guy's coming at you throwing punches. <laughs> It's just a different thing. Yeah, he was the most. It was the most exciting thing ever so when he fast. had a fight coming up. He was so fast. He was so fast for a heavyweight. He was so di- even for then. France. I mean, Francis hits so hard, but he's. It's different. Mike was so fast. The combinations just come like lightning, and he would be shifting side to side, be standing in front of you, throw a hook, and all of a sudden he off to the right, and he would right hook you to the body and hit you with an uppercut, and they would shift to and the that's left. It. And, <laughs> oh my God, he was a fucking he was a, and everybody just a thing would just go down. Oh man, yeah, You're yeah. Like, was... I cried when the Buster Douglas thing happened. <laughs> no, no, I'm serious. I did. Is it really? I, yes, of yeah. course. He, he, was, he the, was the icon of our. Gen- I mean, he reignited <laughs> people's interest in heavyweight boxing because at the time Larry Holmes had retired and there was no <laughs> real compelling heavyweight on the scene. 
And then Tyson came along. You know, but I remember Buster Douglas's mom had just died, yes. and I paid attention. And I also remember reading he was out like eating burgers and things before. I was like, hmm, that Tyson was, yeah, like he would be out, not, yeah. like right before the fight. So I think all those things played in, and and just well, he, I'm sure. I mean, there's certainly overconfidence that comes with someone who just thinks they could destroy anyone that right in front of him. Yeah, well, he could. It's also <laughs> his mentor had died. Customato yeah. had died years earlier, and it was just very different, you know. Uh, and I also think that there's a certain mm-hmm. level of performance that a fighter can only maintain for a certain amount of time, right? Because exactly. the amount of dedication and drive it it's so extraordinary, un- unprecedented. Yeah, yeah, that you really can only do it for so many years. Yeah. And then eventually you, you fall off. Yeah. And I always say, when you talk about all-time greats, you can tell, talk about all-time great careers, and there's people like Bernard Hopkins who had insane careers that went into his 50s. But when you look at, like, the when they burned the hottest, who was the best during that time? There was no one like Tyson. No. There was no one like Roy Jones Jr., there was the, the, there's, but there's, Mike Tyson was also a showman. Like yes. it was a show. It was a show. It was an execution. You were essentially <laughs> you were you just would, even when but, he would just stare at yeah. his opponent right by. Like, he yeah. would stare right through them. Oh yeah. man, yeah, he was awesome. He was an a, an awesome specimen. I mean, just a, 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 a perfect example of an elite boxer who had a very unusual skill set. I mean, to be a short guy for the heavyweight division, but insanely fast Which and just unheard built of. like a brick shit house, just yep. coming in winging bombs. To me, the the Tyson that is the scariest was the Marvis Frazier fight. When he beat Marvis Frazier was before he won the title, and it was uh, on ABC Wide World of Sports. And I remember watching that going, oh, my God, like, who can beat that guy? He was just – it was just different, you know? There was – every other heavyweight looked like they were – like they were stuck in mud. They looked so slow in comparison to him. And the music when he would walk out was just like noise. It sounded like the <laughs> clanging of yeah. steel. And it was like <laughs> – <laughs> Did you ever see the documentary where he describes his mindset from the locker room – up into the time he gets into the ring. No. It's amazing. Because he talks about being afraid, like, in the locker room. But then really? by the time he gets into the into the ring, he's unstoppable. He says, I'm a god. See if you can find that. Because it's, wow. it's so scary. <laughs> it's so extraordinary because he would describe. Question, walking into the ring, you ever get scared? To death. Really? Yeah. yeah. You never look scared. Well, that's the whole thing. Boxing is like acting. You always project what you don't feel on someone else. As I got older, I found out they're more scared of me than I am of them. Hundred <laughs> percent. You know. So once I found that out, you know, I almost stopped training. <laughs> I feel like that was not the case. No, that's not the one. There's, it's a scene from his documentary where he talks about it, and he just and he said, you know, he just talks about like what was going through his mind in the locker room, all the the fears and all the worries and all the different and the things. With them. Yeah. As soon as I come into the ring, as soon as I come into the ring, I'm gloved. No, stop it. That's not true. While I'm in the dressing room, five minutes before I come out, my gloves are laced up. I'm breaking my gloves down. I'm, bro- I'm pushing the lever at the back of my gloves. I'm gloves. breaking the middle of the gloves for my knuckle could pierce through the leg. I feel my knuckle piercing against the tight leather gloves on the Everlast boxing glove. When I come out, I have supreme confidence, but I'm scared to death. I'm totally afraid. I'm afraid of everything. I'm afraid of losing. I'm afraid of being humiliated. But I'm totally confident. The closer I get to the ring, the more confidence I get. The closer, the more confidence I get. The closer, the more confidence I get. All during my training, I've been afraid of this man. I thought this man might be capable of beating me. I've dreamed of him beating me. But that, but I always stayed afraid of him. But the closer I get to the ring, I'm more confident. Once I'm in the ring, I'm a god. No one could beat me. I walk around the ring, but I never, I never take my eyes off my opponent. I keep my eyes on him, even if he's ready and pumping. He can't wait to get his hands on me as well. I keep my eyes on him. I That's keep my work. eyes on him. I keep my eyes on him. Then once I see a chink in his arm, boom, and one of his <laughs> eyes may move, and then I know I have him. Then when he comes to the center of the ring, he still looks at me with his piercing look, and as if he's not afraid, but he already made that mistake when he when he looked down for that one-tenth of a second, I know I had him. He'll fight hard for the first two or three rounds, but I know I already broke his spirit. 
During the fight, I'm supremely confident. I'm moving my head, he's throwing punches. I'm making a miss and I'm countering. I'm hitting him to the body, I'm punching him real hard. And I'm punching him, when I'm punching him, I know he's not able to take my punches. One, two, three punches. I'm throwing him punches and bunches. He goes down, he's the out. Speed. I'm victorious. And the power. Mike Tyson, <laughs> greatest fighter that ever lived. The speed was just insane. The Amazing. speed of those combinations. He's like a, literally like a, a lightweight or a middleweight, but he was 225 <laughs> pounds of fury. I hate to break up this party, but I have to pee so bad. So uh, let's take a little break. We'll be right back. So, I have had legitimate sty- psychedelic states from meditation and from yoga. And and the big one for me is the sensory deprivation tank. I, I've, I've had them. I've had like full blown experiences in the sensory deprivation tank while sober, where if I could give you a yeah. pill that would get that, you to that place, you'd be like, oh my God, amazing. I'm on a drug. And I've come yep. out of that, those psychedelic states, which I, I call psychedelic, you know, I could tell someone I had a psychedelic experience and I didn't take a drug. I had a psychedelic yeah. experience in the sensory deprivation tank, meditating and going through these deep breathing exercises. It's not a psychedelic experience like mushrooms or like dimethyltryptamine or a no, lot it's of like these you other connect to something that's more a beautiful and spiritual and, and a heightened sense of awareness. Very heightened sense of awareness, but also also a completely altered state of consciousness that I don't think you would ever imagine is being is is available to you just naturally. But what I've had in these psychedelic experiences naturally is nothing in compared to what these kundalini masters have. Kundalini masters, and I have a friend who has done this, who trained kundalini yoga for many, many years. Right. And learned how to get to a full-blown, like, hallucinatory psychedelic experience where there's geometric patterns and you're connected yep. to entities. And the way he described it, he's done psychedelics and he's done kundalini. He said it's... Much better. It's No, 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 no. He said they're indiscernible they're the same experience exact same experience like you can get there you can get there naturally yeah which makes sense because the human mind the brain produces psychedelic chemicals they're yeah. endogenously produced particularly dimethyltryptamine it is a naturally produced psychedelic substance that your brain and your whole body creates your brain makes it so whatever you're doing when you're getting hypnotized there is something going on and I mean, I think you could measure it in the brain as far as like fMRI or EEG or some sort of methodology where they would use equipment to measure your brain waves and they would find a difference in the frequency. But I think more importantly than that, I believe there's an endogenous release of certain chemicals, whether it's like here, here's another example. We just did uh, I've got uh, a bunch of comics that are out of shape, and one of the things, that I told them, I said, listen, come in with me. I'll take you to the gym. I'm not going to make you do anything that's going to brutalize you. I'm going to slowly get you guys in shape. And we've been doing it for the past few weeks now. But one of the things we do afterwards is the cold plunge. And so that's the best. It's amazing. The cold plunge is amazing. So my friend Shane Gillis, who did it, we did it yesterday. He got out of it. He's like, dude, I feel like I'm on Molly. I go, right. But you know why? Because your brain ramps up dopamine outside when you get out of the cold plunge you do three minutes your dopamine gets increased by 200 percent, and it lasts for hours hours and hours so you feel like you you are on a drug and it is a drug that your body is producing so you are in a psychedelic state after you get out of the cold plunge and especially if you feel gratitude and you go into it with the right mindset yep. and you leave it you feel so beautiful you feel yeah. so in tune with things yeah yeah do you do the sauna also like yes. sauna to cold play? Yeah, yeah i do back and forth that's my f- yeah. favorite yeah i used to do that at rick rubin's house because his sauna would get really really hot yeah rick We'd rubin and a- i we talk about it all the time yeah. we both and do it do yeah. the cold plunge to the mm-hmm. sauna and it's yes. amazing it's amazing and it does give you a very bizarre altered state of consciousness that is the exact same thing as a psychedelic experience. You I feel like it also makes you tougher to the environment. You know, I think it's like there's a lot of things that it does. Voluntary It also sets your mindset. So like when somebody's going to go into the ocean and like, oh, it's too cold, you know that you can just go in. Yes. I think I used to do that as a kid subconsciously. I would wear a T-shirt all winter and I would like, you know, when we moved to Jersey, we'd walk a mile and a half or whatever it was in the 
freezing cold winter night, and there was a kid, my friend Matt, that used to always wear a T-shirt in the winter, and I thought that was so cool. Everybody else didn't really pay attention, but I would just start wearing T-shirts all winter, and it yes. began, and, and I start. I think that's in a weird way the beginning of like me understanding that you could fight the cold with your mind. Yeah. And, and then when you went into the movie theater, you were perfect. And you felt great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When you're no longer cold, your body's like, and I would never get sick oh, by the way. I'd never get right, sick. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Because it, it really enhances. And everybody that was system. all bundled up all the time there, they were always getting sick. Right. But I was, I, I don't understand you're making it, your body stronger. I think so. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. The cold plunge absolutely does that. But I also love extreme heat too. I do too. Well, I, I think love there's, it. Well, it's like, there's a lot my of My dream, by the that. way, is to have a cold plunge in a sauna. That Why I, don't you have that? I don't know. You the, need to get that. I have that. I have the, it here. <laughs> I have it at home. I, 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 I live off that. I think it's extraordinary. And there's also a lot of like real research <laughs> that backs that up. There's a study out of Finland that was done that showed um, four times a week for 20 minutes. They studied these people over 20 years. And the people that did it four times per week had a 40% decrease in all-cause mortality. Heart attack, stroke, yeah, cancer, uh, everything. for sure. Because of heat shock protein. For sure. So your body's developing these heat shock proteins from the sauna, and it's reducing inflammation. And it, it also increases your cardiovascular output. And that's one of the things that wrestlers, like Dan Gable, who was like one of the most extraordinary wrestlers of all time, he learned that from the Soviets. Because the Soviets in a lot of these Eastern Bloc countries, they were using the sauna as a part of their training. So he started incorporating into his training and using his for his wrestlers. And then it also sweats out the toxins. It does all this amazing stuff to you as well. Like just... Yeah. More importantly, it's the heat shock proteins. That whole toxin talk is like a little. Oh, really? It gets a little oh, fucking hippy dippy <laughs> crystals. But you know, and you know I, went, talk. I went to Finland. I went to the Arctic Circle with my daughter uh, on New Year's a few years ago. And we, we stayed in this ice hotel. Oh, I've heard of that. Yeah, and it was freezing. And the only thing you have, obviously it was freezing, but the only thing you have is a like a little sleeping bag to sleep in. And so we were sleeping in, in those sleeping bags, and the whole night I couldn't get a wink of sleep because I was I was thinking she's going to freeze. Right. So I kept touching her, <laughs> making sure, making sure her okay. neck was okay. Oh, God. <laughs> but yeah. she loved it, and it was amazing. It was well, incredible. I think it would be probably a fun <laughs> thing to do for a night and then go stay in a really nice hotel. Well, that's what we did. Hotel. Then we stayed in these Hot igloo water things. And, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, did you see the Northern Lights when you were up there? The Aurora, uh, Aurora Borealis? Yeah. yeah, amazing. I want to do that. Mom, you've never seen that? No. No, I've never seen that. In Iceland, you can see Yeah, it's amazing. I heard it's insane. Amazing. It's all green, right? Like, oh, you, you'll cry. Yeah. You, yeah, I it's bet. fucking amazing. Yeah, we've talked about doing that for one of our family <laughs> trips, going seeing the, the Northern Lights. It's you have to, to go do that. Yeah, I do. I do have to yeah. do that. There it is. Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> that's Is that the Ice Hotel? Well, no. That, the, no. That's well, like a, they have a bunch, apparently. I'm just... No, that, but that, that one looks amazing. Wow, look at I that. I think it's one of those down there with the sculptures in it. Yeah. Pretty dope. Yeah. yeah There's something the to one. extreme cold and extreme heat where your body understands that it's in danger, and then it becomes stronger resisting it. And it produces cold shock proteins for the cold and heat shock proteins for the heat. I think it's extreme deprivation also. Yeah. It, well, it certainly makes you more resilient for other things, too. If you can do – I start my day with that. The first thing I do before I do anything, I get in the cold plunge. And I do it before workouts. So I get in the cold plunge for Which three minutes. Which takes out the inflammation as well, probably. It does, but it also jacks up your testosterone because for some reason, when you go into extreme cold for three minutes and then you work out, the effect is that your testosterone gets jacked up. That's a really, I, I never heard about this. Yeah, that's something that there was a study out of Japan. And there's it's something that people are just starting to incorporate now that they're starting to realize the benefits of this. But I'll just, start doing that. The but overall health and wellness is just amazing. It's an amazing thing. And, you know, I very, very, very rarely get sick. The last time I was really sick at all was COVID, and I was only sick for a couple of days. Before that, I hadn't been sick in 11 years. And I think a lot of that is training, vitamins, a lot of different yeah. things that I do. But I think And when you start sauna. to feel sick right away, you, cl you go cl super mm -hmm. clean. Yeah. Teas, ginger, yeah. lemon, a little honey, all those things, they definitely work. They definitely work. And it's also recognizing, understanding your body because you're used to exercise. So you have a deeper relationship with your body. You know when your body feels weak. 
Like when I one of the times my whole family got COVID and I didn't. And I think one of the reasons why I didn't is not just that I'm really healthy and I work out a lot, but, but I started working out and I was like, boy, I feel unusually weak today. Like I, I so what I'm going to do is I'm going to stick to a light kettlebell. I stuck to 35 pounds and I'm just going to do a very minimal routine of like uh, 10 clean presses each side, 10 swings each side mm-hmm. and just stop and relax. And that's what I did. And I did that for two days. And then on the third day, I started feeling really strong. And I said, well, let's just push it today. And I went back to a normal workout. So I think my body Mm -hmm. was resisting whatever was going on in my house and all around me. And then I got through it and I never got sick. Do you do anaerobic training? I do all kinds of training. Anaerobic is my favorite. I think that helps with the breath hold. I think it helps with When you everything. say anaerobic training, like what do you do? Where you're depriving your muscles of O2. So let's say we were doing kettlebell swings. Let's say with a 35-pound, you would do 50 of them or 54. I do. I do. Uh-huh. But anyway, so you, you could do whatever high number you want. Then you take a minute, and then you do it again. Then you take a minute, do it again. Or with the battle rope, you, you do, mm-hmm. let's say, you know, 10 minutes straight. And it, it's 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 it builds up such a high tolerance. It's amazing. Mm. Even if you're just doing lunges, you can just do them slowly and 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 really feel the burn. And then it burns for a long time after. Well, your body is like a race car that you could build the horsepower on the engine just through will, just through will yeah. and an intelligent training yep. and doing it properly. Yep, you can you can build your output. You can yep. change how the thing works. But when I'm holding my breath, those things, that that training is exactly what plays a part. Because when I start to feel that pain and I want to quit, I know that I can keep going. Mm. So it's almost like I, I train in extreme you know, conditions to, to be able to do the other stuff. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. And the boundaries of what is possible versus what you think is possible, the only way you explore those is by trying things like that and by doing things like the cold and the heat and just realizing that your body can tolerate a lot more than you think it can. Yeah. And, and you then when build, you get out and you of you build it, a resistance quickly. Yes, you do. Well, yeah. that was the thing with Shane. The first time he got into the water, he couldn't even do a minute. He's like, fuck, fuck. <laughs> and then yesterday he did three minutes. Yep. Yesterday, and it's only been two weeks. So he climbed in there and is like in there for and three like minutes. Nothing, yep. And then he got, I was like, dude, he goes, I feel like I'm on Molly. He goes, this is amazing. I go, it's amazing, right? I go, now let's get in the sauna. You're going to feel so good. And you get in the sauna and you close your eyes and you just you feel like you're flying. Like, ah. Oh. And it's also a great mindset to just walk in. You know, you just, you don't yeah. tiptoe in. You just walk, walk, just walk. Just go in. And you go all the way under, right? Just go in. and then come up. Yeah, just go in. Yeah. Just go in and deal yeah. with it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can just go in and have a normal conversation with people. Yeah. Yeah. But the first time I did it, I couldn't even do a minute and a half. I think I did like a minute and 24 seconds. I was like, oh, Jesus, fuck, fuck, fuck. And then the second time I did it, I did it longer. And the th- I think the third time I did four minutes. And then the fourth time I did it, I did 20 minutes or 21 minutes or something like that. What's the temperature of what, like 40? 33 degrees. 33? Yeah. That was rough. How do you get it to be 33? I have a what's called a Morosco Cold Forge. And it's really cold. It's just above freezing. All right, so like I have I, ice in I it. have to come back at one point. And I crack the ice with, with a, a kettlebell yeah. to get into it sometimes. Or like wow! Pu- There's a video of me pushing aside the ice, where I climb into it. It's on my Instagram. You can see what it looks like. It's just there's just like f- giant floating chunks of ice in this fucker, and I I just climb in there and just deal with it. And it's. Um, and I can talk like normal. I can get in there. My body's so accustomed to it. Yeah. I do it every day. I fucking hate it. Every time I'm about to do it, I don't want to do it. Every time I'm about to do it, I'm trying to figure out a way I can pussy out. So there's two, so you're like Mike two people Tyson in my appro- brain. Approach it. <laughs> <laughs> much, less, much lesser extent, but, but there's two people in my brain. There's this little bitch. Here it is. Here, give me some volume. See all the ice in there? Oh, yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's great. When I first started doing the cold plunge, the uh, it was difficult for me to get to just like a minute and a half. I was freezing. Uh, and I'm still just as cold, but now I understand it. I've been here before. I've experienced it. Are you listening to music? 
No, I'm talking. So that's like the microphone. But I do listen to music. I, I generally listen to books in the sauna. That's one of them, but there's another one that was even more ice. It's just the first one that popped up. Yeah, if you find it, yeah, there's another one, one yeah, that was that even more cool. ice. Yeah, that looks it's cold great. as fuck. Yeah, it looks amazing. Yeah. yeah. But again, part of me is like, don't do it. I don't want to do it. Don't do it. And Mike, that's Mike the Tyson inner bitch. Approaching. That's your inner bitch. <laughs> you got to conquer your inner bitch. And you got to tell your inner bitch, shut the fuck up, pussy. Like my friend John Joseph says. Yeah, it's a mindset. My friend John Joseph, he does a lot of triathlons, and he used to be a drug addict, and and now he's like super disciplined triathlete. And he said the way he says it with his like heavy New York accent, he goes, "Your mind tells your body who's the fucking boss." Yeah, and that's what it is. Like until it doesn't. Until Until it doesn't. (laughs) Yeah, but it is. There's there's a limit, but you have to figure out what that limit is and get to that limit. But I think that, by the way, I think man. that's part of the thing that I love about learning those crazy things, because even like to kiss the cobra, it is. <laughs> no, 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 no. But seriously, yeah, as you approach, it's like all of those thoughts go through your mind. And then right. as you get there, suddenly everything shuts down and it's just you and the cobra and you're hyper alert to its movements, to its behavior. And you're in some sort of a, a, a zone that's that's crazy. And you have to stay very calm or the cobra perceives Exactly. It. And if you're not, you get the hell out. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, that's one of the things that people enjoy about watching your performances is that everyone knows physical limitations and everyone knows that every human being has this inherent desire to avoid discomfort. And the fact that you seek it and you don't just seek it, but you're doing it like in the cold for that frozen block of ice for 60 plus hours. It's fucking insane. And that's like, is he still doing it? Like people would tune in the next day. What, how many days has he been in that fucking block of ice? <laughs> What's the trick? There's no trick. The trick is the mind controlling the body. And well, you e- decide that you can do it. Even with this series that we're doing, you know, I have, I have a team I've imagined is, is helping me put this together so I have a team for the first time and they said oh we're gonna find this we're gonna do that we're gonna skydive off of balloon you know all these I said no find me things that when I hear them I'm gonna be very uncomfortable hearing to even think about doing find me those things that when I hear them I want to run away that's what I want (laughs) so they said okay we're gonna cover you with a quarter million bees you're gonna do this you're gonna be put on fire you're gonna have scorpions oh you know so a lot of things that you did we did on fear factor we covered people with bees on fear factor we covered people with scorpions on fear factor right especially those big ass dark black scorpions what are those called the, what kind of scorpions maybe, are those you, called? maybe like the elephant scorpions or something. I don't remember yeah. what they're called, but the the really big, scary looking, mm-hmm. black, shiny ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and people got lit up by those things too, and they, and they get stung yeah. too. And it's like a bee sting. I think it's like twenty bee stings. Is it like twenty? I think so. Whatever it is, it's not <laughs> I was, good. I was stung Emperor. by the force. Is it an emperor scorpion? Is that yeah, what yeah, exactly. That's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. Those are terrifying. I was looking. stung by the first scorpion. The first one. Is, and you have to stay perfectly still and perfectly calm. And unlike a bee, they don't die. But they with the, keep staying in you. But with the bees, it really was incredible to be, you know, we put the queen and the locket around the neck and then they all oh, swarm wow. you. And when they're all vibrating around your body, it it is one of those feelings. It is pure magic unlike anything you've ever experienced. Wow. <laughs> I don't recommend it, but it is incredible. It's just um, when they when when I shook them off, that's when I think I started to get stung. When bit. we did it on Fear Factor, this was very interesting. We did it at this ranch, and there was a local hive of bees. So we had all the bees that we brought in. We covered people with bees, but then a local hive sent a bunch of bees to find out what the fuck was going on. And the beekeeper knew that these were these were different bees, and he said, "Hey." We have to stop production right now for a while. They have to sort this out because they have to communicate with each other. Right. So somehow or another, these local bees were talking to these bees that we brought in. And they're like, hey, what the fuck are you guys doing here? They're like, oh, we're doing a TV show. I, don't, I mean, whatever the fuck they said to each other. But there was some sort of communication. And apparently it was settled to the point where the local bees were like uh, they had made some sort of an agreement. The local bees left. And then the other bees, and then we went back to filming. But we had to stop down production for, I think it was like a good half an hour. 
where these bees had to work this out. And, and I was saying to the guys- <laughs> These are so incredible. And I was so fascinated. I was like, how are they doing this? Like, what's going on? We don't know. We don't know what they're doing. We don't know how to, but I know that this but is how But even when they want to kill like a wasp, you know, they all yes. surround the wasp and they all vibrate and make the temperature go right. up. And yeah. They're incredible. Right, and how do they know? How do they know to do that? Yeah. How do they know? You know, I have leaf Even cutter. just their hives are so symmetrically perfect. Right, I mean, how do they know how to make that? Yeah. Like what what, what kind amazing. of communication are they having? And they also, they're so efficient too, just the uses of, of space and, and, mm -hmm. and the way they design it is. Yeah like architecture that we can't even do now. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. And they're doing it with their mouths, you know. We um we have leaf cutter ants. Uh it's very common out here. And you know, they'll destroy plants. They just take little pieces of each leaf and you see like a whole line of these ants. And I don't know if you've ever seen leaf cutter ants hive their colonies. They have these incredibly complex systems that they build in the ground. And the way we've found out about these things is by, unfortunately, flooding them with cement. So they'll flood these bee things, these uh, ant colonies, these cutter leaf cutter ants, mm -hmm. these these whatever they would call these uh, these hives or whatever they call it. And then they dig it all out. And when they dig it all out after it's covered with cement, they get to see how insanely complex these structures are. So they have. These little pods that wow. they have, these areas that they have, uh, you know, designated where they build these holes. So they dig in and they remove all the dirt and these long tunnels. And they even have ventilation systems where some of the leaves wow. will ferment. So they have leaves that are slowly decaying and fermenting and they build them so that these leaves have access to oxygen. They have no idea how these leaves, or how these leaf cutter ants are communicating, how they know how to do this, how they figure this out, and how they consistently do this all over the world. Like, look how enormous this structure is that they're digging out. And this is all because That's they filled the entire thing up with, com with, with concrete. So here's their pouring this concrete. So you, there you see the leafcutter ants. You see the, the surface area. And then they slowly dump this concrete in there, which is like a fucking genocide of leafcutter ants. Unfortunately, it's the only way they can find this out. And then once they do that, once they've done it, then they allow it to harden and then they slowly dig it out. It takes a long time. But the result is this knowledge of this insane insect wow. that has these complex structures. Yeah, that is crazy. It's amazing. Yeah. Because it, if you think of how tiny an ant is and how big that is. That's akin to like Manhattan. <laughs> like, what the fuck Probably are they doing? More. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. And how? What's going on? Like, how do they know how to do this? Every, how do they know how to do this in Africa? And they also know how to do this in Texas. How do they know how to do this? Yeah, it's unbelievable. What's going on? Yep. It's crazy. Yep. Never underestimate anything, anyone. <laughs> yeah, but it also makes you wonder, like, what, what is being stored in the genes? And what do we have in what kind of information do we have in our genes that's inherent to the, the species? That's just like a part of you as a human being that's in there. Maybe that is like one of the reasons why people are naturally afraid of snakes. A yeah. lot of people are naturally afraid of, you know, yeah. monsters. Yeah. Scary things. Hardwired. Yeah. Hardwired yeah. for that. Yeah. Yeah. Because like kids aren't necessarily born afraid of car accidents. But car accidents are much Cars, more likely yeah. to kill you than a monster. Right. But kids are terrified of monsters. Right. Well, what's a monster from? Well, it's probably our memory, our genetic memory of cats, of big cats that want to yep. kill us. Yep. In the yep. dark. Right? Monsters <laughs> are always in the dark. Yep. Cats are nocturnal. Yep. They have big teeth. They're scary. They hide yeah. and wait for you. Well, that's why people are wired to feel really you know, uncomfortable when they're standing on stage and have to speak publicly. It's like the number one fear. And, and the reason is because the, the hard wiring is, you know, when we were on an elevated platform with lots of eyeballs looking up at us, those were predators, those were lions or other tribes or whatever it was. So we had to be fearful. So it's hardwired. So people, when they stand on stage, they're not at risk of getting eaten by a lion, but they still have those really uncomfortable feelings well i've been told that it's because you're being judged like you did something wrong 
So, but when, I think it's more deeply rooted than that. I think if you're on an elevated platform and you have lots of eyeballs on you, you're an easy target. But it's not always elevated. Like sometimes people don't like speaking in front of people that are at the same level. Of them, I think. But it's just lots of eyeballs yes, on you. Lots of eyeballs. Yeah. But I think it's you're being judged. And most most of the time, I think in tribal cultures, if you were being judged, you'd probably done something wrong, and you're probably being sure. tried. Is it probably being tried? Probably a combination because yeah. earlier before that, right? You know, when probably a lot of factors. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a very interesting, like what, like how the mind works and how many complex layers are in there. How anxiety works, how fears work, yep. how people can trick themselves into thinking the worst case scenario is definitely going to happen, and they which just is, mind fuck themselves. Which is part of the survival mechanism. Yes. Yeah, because that's the ability to anticipate danger. But you can change that part of your brain. Yes. You can slowly, the way your friend slowly built a resistance to be able to go into the cold plunge, mm-hmm. you could do the exact same thing with any fear that you have yes and people that don't have any experience with scary things everything's scary you don't have any experience with adversity right any experience with overcoming things any experience with doing things that make you nervous or fucking everything's gonna make you nervous yeah yeah if you're too sheltered you're fucked yeah and that's the one thing that everybody's terrified of their children being too sheltered yes we all know children that are too sheltered and that don't try dangerous things or scary things or things that make them nervous well those kids are fucked when they go out into the real world yeah you haven't prepared them properly yeah yeah it's a tricky balance it is a tricky balance because you, you know, want to protect was, them yeah i was alone a lot as a kid and that also is really difficult you and know? dangerous and dangerous yeah yes. that's the other thing like you never yeah. like free range children yeah but you learn a lot you, you know, do you learn, learn a lot survival if you live. When I would get mugged when I was a kid, I, rem- I didn't have a, a dad growing up in Brooklyn, but I would see like uh, a man across the street, and I'd have like five kids mugging me. I'd be like, "Dad," and they would like run away because they were like thirteen. I was like six, yeah. so I learned quickly how to get out of bad situations. Mm, yeah. <laughs> how many times did you get mugged? A couple, you know, three, something mm. like that. Yeah, it, it wasn't. A big deal, then. Right, but up. if you do survive those situations, you gain what they call street smarts. Yes. Yeah. And you learn, and you adapt, and you learn quickly. You also learn yeah. that human beings are not always nice. There's a lot of human beings that are not nice. Yeah. Well, in certain situations. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. you could also find human human beings that are not nice, and you can make them nice quickly if you know how to be calm and give the right energy and sometimes you know, I, I, I had um after a skydive injury i broke my foot and i was walking around with a boot on and i was walking around paris and i saw um uh a, a guy driving a truck and a bicycle delivery guy were in a heated argument and the guy with the bicycle had his bike lock in his hand and they were about to beat the hell out of each other and i just walked into the middle of them and i said uh pense un car, you know think of a card in french and uh, they both looked at me like, who is this weirdo? And suddenly the fight was diffused. You just you know? diffused yes. it with a card trick? Well, I didn't get to the card trick part, but just there's a guy here right. and they're both heated up. But like if one goes against me, then it's too, you know, so it kind of diffused it. But I have diffused fights with card tricks many times. Really? Yes. How have you done that? Well, I see people like about to fight like in Union Square and I just walk right in the middle. I'm like, here, let me show you card trick because I'm not their enemy. <laughs> and they're so confused. And then I do magic and then it's over. Well, I think also a lot of times when people <laughs> (laughs) are involved in an altercation they're looking for a way out and they don't know how to get out of it and so if you disrupt that like oh now is a new thing to concentrate on yes it it alleviates some of the tension that's right and then by the time you're done it's already over yeah (laughs) that's hilarious is that you so did you start out doing that street magic is that when you first started doing magic i mean i was doing magic since i was like five years old so i would do really simple mathematical tricks but then I started to learn more and more, and then you know I was a magic nerd at the age of ten, and then um, and then I would kind of just walk around like practice shuffling cards and stuff like that. And we moved back into the city. One time I was doing a one-handed shuffle, and a bunch of guys that were working at the parking garage saw me doing the shuffle, and they thought it was amazing. It's like ah, and they came over, and I started doing magic, and their reactions were amazing. And that's kind of when I realized, oh, like yeah, m- magic's pretty amazing to perform because before that i didn't i only performed for a couple of friends 
luckily, because kids are a tough audience for a magician. And so whenever I have, like, whenever I'm teaching a young kid magic, I say, do it to your friend's parents, not to your friends, not at school, because one bad experience and you don't want to ever do magic again. Right. You know? Yeah. But parents and their friends are going to be a nice audience. <laughs> <laughs> That's good advice. Back then, how would you learn how to do, say, card tricks? Because Back was then, all you had was books, right. back, which was amazing. I mean, you would read books and you'd read this trick and then you would learn it step by step and then you would do it and then you'd do it and then you'd do it and when you did it a thousand times it started to become like your own thing and then you might change something about it and then you'd really make it your own and then to this day they're still evolving like whenever I do magic I'm still thinking and processing and adding little tweaks so it doesn't stop mm. yeah well, magicians are notoriously secretive about their methods so like do, how much do they teach you in books Books and magic have a lot, but the good stuff is hard to come across. It's not in books. How old are the books? Like, what's the oh, oldest they, magic I mean, book? They, well, the first one was like, uh, I think it was called Discovery of Witchcraft from like 1584 or something like that. And a guy wrote all these secrets of methods that like witches were using and they were being burned alive. So he's like, here, this is how they're doing it. It's tricks. You got to stop killing the witches. And oh, then wow. they destroyed all the copies of that book, but some survived. And and, and that book has incredible secrets that I've done on my TV shows. Like there's one where you take a dead fly and bring it back to life. That's written up from 1584. Wow. <laughs> I believe it's 1584. That was one of the interesting things that I read about the invention of the printing press, that once they started making books, some of the first books were about how to spot witches. Like I was thinking that, oh, back then it must have been amazing because now all of a sudden people could like write down all this knowledge and people can learn. Like, nope. Some of the first books, like the most popular books, are like How to Spot a Witch. <laughs> and there was a lot of, I guess, I guess, well, like who was the first person to figure out card tricks? Is there like a, like a fucking originator? I would, the... I would assume, so, like there, there's a book written by a guy that called himself Erdnase, the expert at the card table, and he had so many secrets in this book that are so relevant to all of the magic that any card magician does to this day. And he was using it mostly for cheating or oh, to, to explain how people were cheating. Yeah, because they would... Uh, they right. would Poker and, games. And, yes. Yeah. And, and to this day, but when you're a cheat at cards... You have to work on three moves and be flawless because you cannot get busted. So if you're a card cheat and you get busted, you're going to get your hands broken or worse, right? right? So these guys that were card cheats, their moves are technically perfect. I remember I was with a guy named Doc and we were surrounded by a bunch of magicians and he just did a cut the deck, complete the cut, switched the whole deck and none of us could see it. None of us could see the deck being switched out. It was invisible. And he now magicians will work on thousands of moves, right? So they don't have the time put in to be as flawless as this guy, but this guy needs it to survive, whereas a magician's using it to entertain. So you have room margin for error, right? Right. But these these card sheets, their precision is it doesn't even make sense. There's moves that you see that you just can't rationalize and you can't explain how they're done. Really? Yeah. <laughs> now, how does one do a cut the deck cheat? Switches the whole deck. So if it was a red deck right here, he cuts the deck in half, completes it, and it's a blue deck. And you cannot see it happen. And he's doing it with one hand? One-handed. Where's the other deck? <laughs> I'm not going to tell. <laughs> <laughs> but I could give you one hint. Okay, give me a hint. He does have some money in his hand. It could okay. hold some hundreds or whatever. Right. That's the only hint I'm giving, but it's flawless and incredible. But mm. there's lots of guys that just are incredible. There's a guy named Rod the Hop, and he used to go to the New York. He passed away recently in prison, but he used to go to the New York underground casinos. And when he was a kid, I think he was like 15, he would just go to watch, right, to see because he – he was a magician, but he was like, oh, what could be done? I think that's what he went. And one day there was a guy that was like in his late 60s, and he said to the guy, um, I saw what you were doing. And the guy's like, no, you didn't, kid. And he's like, yeah, I did. And he's like, then tell me what I was doing. 
and Rod said you were put. He had a button up shirt, and he said you were switching cards through your shirt. And the guy's like, well, "How do you how do you know that? Because it's invisible." And he said, "Well, I'm a magician." He said, "You're not a magician anymore." And he taught Rod the Hop how to cheat. And from that day on, Rod the Hop became one of the best cheats ever. And then he went to prison because he had a a card. I met him before he went to prison, and he had a, a little device that he would put into all the slot machines, and they'd all pay out nine grand. And eventually, the casinos got wind of it because they're like, "Why is every machine paying out nine grand here, then here, then this?" And so they put him in prison, and he passed away there. But that. Oh, guy wow. but that guy's chops were every magician that ever saw him which is rare he didn't mix with a lot of guys but he mixed with a few all blown away beyond <laughs> and it's just simply practicing something to the point where your hands Three moves are moving so quickly just, and so smoothly and mis is it misdirection as well no you could no. be burned you could have cameras up you could do no 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 these moves are invisible. <laughs> wow. Yeah. How does one make a move invisible? I mean... Is it just repetition or understanding what to do to make it invisible? I mean, I, I'll show you a move that's just invisible. Okay. But it's, let's see. I mean, it's just a move, though. So, okay. I mean, so you just so pull just, out a deck so of cards. All, all you have to do is if you want to take a card and, you know, that's invisible. Like no matter what you do, you can't see it. So, but it's just a simple move, you know. It's just you take a card and then you take the, you know. But that's uh. invisible. But that's used in so magic. So for people that are just but listening, you had a card that was a heart, and then you flipped it over to a spade. a spade. But but that's do that again. <laughs> so you just take a card, you do like that, and then you do that, and then it's there. What the fuck? Yeah, but that but but what I'm saying is that's used by magicians. But imagine this beyond in a whole nother way that you cannot see anything. My friend just that my, I can't see anything. But my friend has been working on a move for years and years that he's never gonna use that only I think one other person besides him in the world can do. And he he, he was written up by all of the Every magician, not every magician, but lots of magicians were really upset saying that move is impossible. There's no way to do it because, and I, I saw, I watched it with my own eyes many times. And as soon as I pulled out my camera, I was like, could I film it? He put the cards away and I never saw it again. Really? <laughs> can we film that? Can we film you doing that? So we can play it back in slow motion? <laughs> you just doing that? Yeah. Yeah, I will. A right now? Bit. In a little bit. In a little bit? <laughs> Jamie, what's this little bitch shit? What's he doing? <laughs> Jamie's got two cameras on you now. He's hip to it. Oh, I see. You couldn't see it. Yeah, I'll, I'll do yeah. it. I'll do it in a bit, though. Okay. Yeah. Why in a bit? Well, I'm sure. I could do it now. Okay. But it's just a move. Okay. Hold on a second. It's actually my favorite move, though. But it's just it's just this. You take a card, and then you take the card and do that. Do so it's again? just a move. <laughs> do it again? Yeah, can but you, I mean, I should, it? you take yeah, a move, yeah, you do that, and you do like that. You know, it's just a move. But I'm just saying, like, there's so many moves that are so relevant and that are so amazing if you want to be a card cheat where you do this with such precision that nobody could ever detect it. Have you ever done that playing poker just to blow people's minds? Yeah, when I was like 18, I went to one of my friend's like uh, college games and I cheated everybody just to see if I could, but then I returned all their money. I said, guys, I'm a magician, I just cheated everybody here. But I just wanted to prove, and I told my friend whose house it was that the game was in. Thank God you did that. <laughs> but that's That must have been blown them away though. Yeah. Because most people yeah, think, yeah. I'm watching But also hands. nobody knew that I was a magician. Right. Like all my friends growing up, only my best friends knew that I did magic. What and I even I went through the silly phase of, of like trying the, the ridiculous tricks, like an appearing cane. I was like eleven and I did this thing where a cane appears and went pop, pop my eye out. I had I had to wear <laughs> Yeah, it was like I, I scratched my cornea, I couldn't I, I couldn't use my but but that I think that was part of the reason that I never went into like the the illusions or the you know ma I didn't have magic kits I had a deck of cards and then things that would you would find laying around so I think part of the magic that I love is when you're using real things and real places and 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 that is the magic you know and it's essentially learning a movement 
till you get to it. Where and it's, you have to make it look as natural as possible. But when you're doing that, it looks it's it looks <laughs> insane because it doesn't make any sense. Like I'm just seeing you're not even moving fast. You're just. I turning. had a guy just flying from London just to. He's like so incredible, um, and his name is Andrew Frost. He is amazing, and he. I just spent time with him just so I could sit there and have him tweak me because he's so brilliant. He has like that mindset of a card sheet, but he's a magician. But he's so precise. It's like I want you to watch everything that I do, and I want you to pick apart everything. You know, because I also don't get the opportunity to sit there and do card tricks all day and all night because I do these other things. So it's like I, I lose time on doing this thing that I love doing because I'm like, oh, how can I learn how to do this thing with the snake? Right, right. right. But like these guys that just do this day and night are the best in the world. And they perform for magicians because a magician can appreciate the amount of time and work that goes into what they're seeing. Yeah. You see, I mean, nobody else, when you see it, you just see a simple trick, right? Yeah. But when I see a magician perform, I see how, I'm like, oh, this guy's put 10,000 hours in on that move. <laughs> how many hours do you think you put in on that? simple trick oh my whole did. that's my whole life that's been forever that's my whole life that's like the that, that start that started with my best friend who's my mentor also that, that that showed me the correct way to do it and i was like 18 and then i think i've i he i was with him at a card thing in cleveland a week ago and he still corrected me wow yeah wow <laughs> after all these years he's like oh i forgot to tell you you need to do this Oh, wow. <laughs> but it's so strange. But that's why, to me, it's a constant learning curve. Yeah. You know? And it's fun to discover all these secrets because they're not readily available. You have right. to search hard for the good stuff. And then you have to put the work in. Yeah. And then me, and my friend doesn't perform ever. He just loves the technical part of it. But then I have to now learn how to perform it. And then I go out and fail over and over and over and over and over. <laughs> and then eventually it starts to become decent and then eventually it becomes something I'm happy about. I did mean, you, I'm never fully happy. I'm always like tweaking, 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 you know. Did you film yourself initially to make sure that you couldn't see yourself doing these things? No, I, I like to put myself in the hot seat and I like to just go out there, perform it and then fail and then learn from that. But but yeah, it would be better to set up a camera, film yourself, watch it a thousand times. Sure. In the beginning, did you have a lot of people that busted you? Like, I see what you're doing. Well, the good thing about being a magician is nobody knows where it goes. So at the end, you, you can always curve, and that's like jazzing almost. So even if you're off, you can still go. You can improvise. Yeah, which is probably like fighting, right? Like you're you're in a weak position, but you can right. You, you can adjust, and yeah. improvise, yeah. yeah. And and that's what I think makes a magician really great as well. Hmm. The ability to yeah to just keep turning, yeah, keep turning. You know. Interesting. And if you have enough tricks up your sleeve, you mm. can almost like have them believe that the first couple ones. Well, it's all or it's all part. Yeah. The outcome. Yeah. 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 But I fumbled before, but then I just keep going. <laughs> uh, it's like bombing on stage or like fucking a joke up. And then... Yeah, but bombing on stage is that's where you learn. That's like where you learn the most. So every time I've been on stage and everything is like a disaster, that's always the biggest learning curve. And then usually I get energized and then you really. Yeah, most certainly. Yeah. That's with comedy as well, because like you realize like, God, that sucked. I got to get better. I got to figure out what I did wrong and then never do that thing that I did wrong again and figure out a way to make it better. Right. And the yeah. way you play in little venues and you repetitiously yes. do the comedy act and you, you 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 keep the stuff that you like, you tweak it, you work yeah. on it for like a year. That That's that's what I think a good magician does mm. is the exact same formula as a comedy show. How many different card tricks do you think you know? I, I could go on forever. <laughs> 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 is that sort of the um, the foundation of your magic? It's card tricks. I just love the way they feel. There's like a mm. just the, it's like a digital fixation almost. Just the way mm. they feel in the hand, the size, the shape. The and is, is this must be something that you have to practice constantly. Yeah, it's day and night. That's all you do. So you practice still all to the this time. day, all, the, all time. the time. Yeah. Wow. By yourself most of the time. Yeah. I mean, I'm holding cards all the time. Yeah. Always. Do you ever leave the house without cards? No. Wow. 
No way. <laughs> Never. Even if I came with you to do the cold plunge, the deck of cards would be right next to it. Really? Yeah, and I always still wake up with cards stuck all over my face, my neck, every all the time. <laughs> yeah. All the time. Wow. That's crazy. You have to be married. <laughs> that's that's so nuts. Like you have to be married to card tricks. And that's the only way to be as good as you're at. Well, I think it's also like the, you know, anybody could have access to a deck of cards and there's so much material and so much that you can learn. Yeah. I might yeah. take some of that. Get some of that. Here you go. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Cheers, sir. It's Cheers. Yeah. Always good to see you. Yeah, you too. I'm always blown away. I'm always blown away because when I see you and you do card tricks, I always think, next time I see him, I'm going to pay attention and I'm going <laughs> to figure it out. Nope. Did you get it? I mean, I, <clears throat> I think I forgot to switch the camera, but I'm watching him do that in a <laughs> side angle from zoomed in. Couldn't see it. Four times <laughs> in a row. Couldn't see it. And even if you slow it down? No, and even, I'm watching the guy he just said, Andrew Foss. I'm watching him. He's do amazing, a trick. right? I'll show you. It's yeah, in slow he's, motion. Yeah. Oh, I did it frame by frame. I kind of know where he did the one he's switch. He's incredible. But you don't know where it went. Like Let's see it. I'll do all this so here. It's called Too Many Aces for those that are just watching. Okay. okay. Oh. So, so you have four aces. You probably assumed already, if you had cut me a queen, we would have ended up with like 12 aces. Mm. Let's have a look. This guy is so good. Yeah. Oh. Four aces. Oh. But having 12 aces, right, would be inconvenient because then you couldn't fit them inside the box, you couldn't do anything like that, right? Sure. And you end up with just the four aces. And the real thing is, is if you lose track of what aces come from what card, because mm. then you can't put them back together and you end up with this useless deck of cards, which is just full of aces the entire time. And then, yeah, you just can't, can't put them back which is why it's important to do this. What? <laughs> what yeah. the hell? What? And then that way, you can put them back inside the box and you don't get this useless. <laughs> Yeah. What the? Did you catch anywhere no. where he would have But by the way, that's the yeah. least of what he does. Yeah. I mean, he is a phenomenon. But there's I, lots of guys, by the way, that are just mind-blowing with their sleight of hand. How many guys like do the, that in poker games? Oh, it lots. Must, it must be a lot of guys a getting lot. ripped off. Yes, of course. Yeah. You know that. I don't know that. I don't play poker. You, you know, but there's tons I'm, I'm of asking. cheats. I'm, I, I, never met guy, I met I a guy know. once. I was uh, the first time I met Mike Tyson. I, I went to his hotel at the Trump International and um, I was doing magic to everybody, you know, because Muhammad Ali used to do magic and he taught Mike how to levitate and stuff like that. So Mike was kind of into the whole magic thing. And I started showing him all these things and uh, a guy pulled me aside and he was like, you know, I, I, I do some stuff too. And I was like, w w what do you do? And he's like, well, I, I, I gamble. You know, sometimes I go out with these guys and I win a lot of money. And I was like, so what are you doing? And he said that when they're playing in New York he would go to all the delis near where they were playing and he would take the decks of cards that they sell at the deli and he would swap them for identical decks of cards that were all completely marked but invisible. So now he would go into the game, let's say on Upper Park Avenue, and as they were about to play, he'd say, wait, I don't trust the house deck. Let's, can you get new decks? And the, and the person whose house it was would call one of the local delis and the delis would come up with a bunch of decks and now all of the decks that were sealed and everything, they would crack them open, put them into play and he knew every card. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> now how does someone... But that, by the way, that and that's not even a sleight of hand version right. of cheating, but think about a guy that's doing crazy sleight of hand. Right. Now how does one, mar how, how are cards marked? There's a million ways. There's even something you could do with the red back card that's called Dob, where you put some sort of like a red waxy thing that's almost invisible. But if you have a contact lens over the pupil that, that has a little red spot in the middle, you could see it better. But there's Whoa. lot I know, but there's lots of ways to mark decks. I mean, I'm not going to get into those, but there is a lot of easy ways to mark a deck. I'll show you after. Okay. I, I have some. How come you don't want to get into it 
now. <laughs> no, 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 no. I get no, in trouble. No, no. I get in trouble. Get in trouble? By, yeah, yeah. No, How no, so? no. Oh, by other magicians? Oh, yeah. Oh, I understand. Yeah. Okay. But I so worked it's... for two years on a, on a system. So these these decks have a system that's amazing. That Can I, I see that? Yeah. That was kind of like as a kid, I had one deck of cards. And when I would drop it on the subway, I'd have to pick it up and I would have like a, it doesn't feel right. And I would carry it everywhere for years. And my dream was to one day have unlimited decks. And then when I started to make my own decks, that was kind of like highlight. You make your own decks of cards? Yeah. yeah. Are these yours? Yeah. Are and these the, marked? These ones are mine that I have in my show in Vegas. So I put my name on it so they keep it. And um, Are these marked? Yeah, those ones are. But by the way, I never use it in magic. I just like it. I just like to work. Because when I was young, I would go to the magic store, Tannins, and we couldn't afford the marked decks, of course, but they looked really special. It was called Magic See Through the Card Deck. And they were so expensive. So I started selling my decks of cards that I worked diligently on the system for years. And magicians would have them and not know that they were even marked. And then I would see magicians. I'd say, oh, hold up the card. And I would tell them what it was. So this is a marked deck right here. Yeah. Can I open this? Yeah. Okay. And if I open you this. You want me to open it? Here, I can open it. No, I don't trust you. It's, I, <laughs> I don't trust you. I'm fucking going to swap it out for something else. <laughs> oh, that's a good way. Yeah, that'll do. Trust this motherfucker. <laughs> the Google images for Mark Cards is kind of interesting. There's a few fun ways they do it. Yeah, this one I think is very clever, though. I think this one's marked in the actual corner where you can see the art, I guess, is done that way. Oh, the number yeah. two. Yeah, oh, yeah. I don't like it, though, when because those decks, I don't like if, if, you, if you leave them behind, they can see that there's something. This has the contact lens one, so when you put the lens on, you just can, like, see it. Oh, uh, yeah, exactly. wow. <laughs> I never knew that. Luminous. Jamie, you're so good at finding everything. He's a wizard. I think a lot of card cheats are going to be really angry at everybody. You the think way. so? Well, card <laughs> cheats, they're dirty people. They should be angry. They should be angry that we're onto them. Okay, I'm going to see if there's anything I can see. No, you won't see it, but take out the two jokers on the top and bottom. Yeah. Why? Well, what, are the, what is that? Is that a joker? Yeah, yeah, a joker I designed. Me swallowing a sword. Oh, but God. You could just take that out. Take those out. Yeah, okay. and take they, out the top two cards. Marked? No. I don't no. trust you. They no, you don't. Most marked. <laughs> Do you trust him? <laughs> I do. trust this yes. motherfucker. <laughs> okay. Now what does this yeah, say? Nothing. It says, uh, what does it say? Well, it is reads. Is it real? No, but then turn it upside down. <laughs> what does that say? Magic. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I see. yeah. Okay. So this is, this is marked. Yep. But if you show it to me that way, I can see it. But if you hold it up the other right. way, then I can't, you know. Glasses. There's no way I can see this. I need to study this shit. I broke my glasses. Think I can figure it out, Jamie? Wow. I mean, you have to know what he did. There's a you know, Well, I feel like there's a way I can like stare at it long enough. No, I you're not. See no way. Off. Nope. Waldo you're not right gonna now. get it. And you'll know nope. what he looks like. You don't know what he looks like. Yeah, you're not gonna get it. No I'm way. Not? Uh uh No chance. Zero chance. He did though. No. I don't see jack shit. But the way you could really oh, look is you wait put... wait a minute. I see no, the, you, the bottom is different. Nope. But the way you look at it is if you put two cards side by side, that because otherwise you can't tell. Okay. I'm putting two cards side by side here. What do I notice that's different? By the way, even from here I can see, like, the top card. This one right here? Yep, even from here. I don't see shit. Damn it. Yeah, you're not gonna. No. So you could tell just by looking yep. at, like, what is this right here? Two of spades. Jesus Christ! How? And any, if you brought this to Vegas, any competent dealer would recognize that that's a mark card, or I no? Don't, I don't think so. I mean, no, because I brought it to Steve Forty, who's like the best card sheet and, uh, and he magician. Didn't recognize it? He said it was a very advanced and really good system. What's this one? Queen of Hearts? <laughs> Damn, son. How about this one here? Three of Diamonds? God damn but you know, I, I'm going to show... No, but after, I'm gonna sh I'll give you Fuck. a little... No, but after, I'll give you <laughs> a little hint. After. Yeah. After. After the show. Not on camera, yeah. Not on no camera. way. 
I'm telling everybody. I'm gonna get on Instagram. <laughs> you're gonna no, you're not. You absolutely won't. I'll but you, I'll but you. Oh yeah, give him can the deck. You? Well, I, I don't know. Really? Okay. Well, you Hold the luck. Second. You've luck. <laughs> Hold on a second. I'm gonna bring this up. Well, here, here. this deck also here. Yeah, fine. Okay. <laughs> well, I need to give me have one more just so I can compare it to something. By the way, I worked on this for years. Should I give one little hint? No. Sure. No, I'm going to give one little hint. What is the little hint? The ace is the easiest one to identify. The ace is the easiest one. Yeah, that's my only hint. Okay. (laughs) I I see nothing but (laughs) patterns that look... I I worked with my very good friend who's a great magician, Doug, on this for two years we worked. Is it magic guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My guy, my guy. No, I mean, like, is it... uh... When you Magic just, eye, yeah, like like when you, you stare blur at the it thing out, and it becomes the thing. Are you unfocused? That your has eyes? a little bit to do with it, by the way. All right. That, Jamie, that's, that's hard to do. Jamie, that's really good that you just Jamie's got winner. that. I have another deck as well, but it's in the car. But I have another deck. Jamie's that... also got a touch of the tism. Well, he can see some things. You're seeing he's, something. It's a spectrum. He's got a. He's got a <laughs> sense. He's got a different mind. He works different. He can see things that other people can't see. I can't really unfocus my eyes though, but yeah, I don't know what it would be. <laughs> By the way, as a magician, I never ever use it in my card tricks, but it was just such a fun thing to work on. I mean, the, <laughs> that one. that one's a really hard one that you're looking at. They look really identical. Yeah, they're all fucking hard. They look exactly the same. <laughs> it's just it's so interesting to me that there's something that is so clear to you. That is, <laughs> yeah. But when I teach you this, you're gonna it, you're, you're gonna be like, whoa. Okay. Like it'll make perfect sense. Want to end the podcast right now, just so I can see it. <laughs> we, can, we can cut it out or go in the other room. Just to no, sure I'm not, not doing this on camera. Right no right way. He doesn't trust you. Oh, so you can go in the other room and talk about it and come back. I actually, I'm sure you would, but still, it, I, I would feel weird. Okay. Well, I'm seeing something here. Hold on. I want to give one more hint, but I'm not give going me, to. Give me that hint. Give me that hint. Uh, Don't do it. Come on, son. No, I'm not going to give the hint now. Give me that hint. Oh, wait a minute. I'm seeing something. I'm seeing something. Hold what on. are you seeing? I'm, I'm seeing a disruption. There's something that's different about this. Yes. Really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see something. Yeah. God damn it. What is it? <laughs> And you're going to lose it right away. I can see a very specific, there's very specific lines that go up and down like this that I see that, that are clear. And if I look at it a certain way, I can see it clearly. So you're blurring your vision. You can uh-huh. blur your vision. Is that what you're I doing? I thought I had it. And I was like, ah, this is going to be a diamond. Oh, and, and I, I see lines at the bottom. So I see something. Not that at the looks bottom. Like two. No, not at the bottom. What is this? Nope. Five. Hmm. See, I was Wrong. Off too. <laughs> Wrong. I thought it was a diamond. It's not. It's a spade. Okay, I'm an idiot. No, no, it's it's a it's an advanced. I think it's pretty advanced. Oh, it's fucking advanced as shit. I am. <laughs> I'm doing all kinds of weird things with my eyes to try to pick up patterns. But there are different. There's some different. One hundred percent. There's a different pattern to this one on my right than there is to the one on my left. That's true, but it's almost imperceptible. But sure, if you can blur your vision and then. Think but there's about clear it. lines on this that go up that are slightly different. They go uh, at an angle. There's two very clear lines on the one, the, this one on my right hand, that don't exist on the one on my left. And you can see it without your glasses on? Yes, I can see hmm. it better without my glasses on. Yes. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get killed in the magic world, by the way. <laughs> I see, there's this a very like, clear is, pattern on this one too, uh, that exists, that doesn't exist on this one. But God, you have to look at it so weird to see it. But I do see it. But you know, lots like if I'm of magic. looking at it kind of abstractly, <laughs> I can see that pattern. Wow, what is it? Wow. Lots of magic is like logic puzzles. So it's like you have to break something apart in every single possible direction to figure out a solution. God, it just makes me so, I mean, I don't play cards, but if I did, I'd be so uncomfortable because I'd be like, how do I know? How do I know that I'm not getting fucking robbed? There's a lot of guys that cheat. 
Oh, I would I imagine. Yeah. Do you think, like, in a lot of these uh, high-level poker For games sure. where you get a lot of dorks that yeah. have a lot of money and they, they want to be of high course. rollers? Yes. And they get robbed by people? Of, uh, uh, come on. I mean, you've heard about this. There's oh, yeah. People get in yeah. trouble for it all the time yeah didn't phil ivy go to a casino and he found a flaw in the way the cards were printed that nobody could see and i heard something like he, that and, and then he they made didn't millions want millions of dollars and, and they, they wanted to take the money back well how could they say that though what he didn't do anything wrong it, just because he saw something that I mean, seems insane did he tell people he is that what say, it is he didn't say anything so how the fuck do they know they said that he was able to detect a slight misprint where the pattern was slightly off, he could detect it and then use it to play. God, your vision must be so important for a, a player like that. Like if you have a, like a, if you're slowly yeah, but I think you can adjust. No, I think you can adjust. I think you can adjust. I think you can solve around it. Yeah, but I mean, as your vision goes shitty as you get older, like it would be harder yeah. and harder, right? Yeah, you'd have to get contact. Sure. Yeah. This show is boring as fuck because I am just staring at cards. <laughs> <laughs> it's never, I'm never going to figure it out. But I do detect that there's something going on. I can see when I blur my eyes, I can see that there's discernible patterns that are in certain cards that aren't in other cards. If I do teach it to you, you cannot. I won't tell anybody okay. except right. Brian Callen. He tells everybody. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, I'll, I, I won't tell anybody. I promise. I promise. I'll tell Jamie, but he'll. Have yeah, to, no, no. I'm gonna show. I'm gonna teach to both of you. I'm not gonna isolate Jamie's Jamie. Jamie's a vault. He's not gonna no, tell no. anybody. Plus, Jamie will figure it out anyway. I like think he'll so? find the secrets. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You think so? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jamie can find anything. So if you didn't yeah. have a podcast to. Pro no, he'd produce, find it. Yeah, yeah. He would. Yeah, he would find it. Yes, I'm sure. Interesting. I definitely see differences in the lines when you look at it a specific way. I just don't know what I'm looking for or what I'm seeing. By the way, the, the deck is called the White Lions. Ooh. Why is that? Uh, oh, yeah. oh, is there White Lions in here that I'm missing? Nope. <laughs> Nothing to do with it. Just what? on the box. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Well, what does that have to do with that? I'm not telling. That's uh, yeah, <laughs> misdirection. Probably has nothing to do with Lions. Oh, wrong. It's you are. Uh, really? we'll, we'll discuss it later. I'm not going to discuss it I'm now. looking for a lion in here now. Uh, uh, no, you're not going to see a lion. <laughs> what am I going to say? How many this different coffee is good, by the way. Black Rifle oh, yeah, is the it's best. Good. Um, how many different kinds of marked cards are there? There's so many. Yeah? Yeah. But but those are used by cheats. Right. Not really by magicians. They're not necessary in magic. God, how does someone know? If you're a person who's like, I enjoy playing cards, like you're going to get fucking robbed, right? Well, there's also people that can mark the deck as they play. Oh, of course. How? I'm not telling. Oh, come on. <laughs> no, I can't. But there's people that as they're playing, they're, they mark the whole deck, but it's imperceptible. I believe you, but I don't want to. You know what I'm saying? Like, I do <laughs> believe you because I've seen you do things that I can't believe you're doing, and you're just doing them right in front of me. But, there's... but these guys that cheat, it's very different because they work on three moves for years and years and years, and they are flawless. So if you're in a like a, just that's a why I said about that guy game. Andrew Frost, his technique on, and the stuff that he's doing, it, I think it's card sheet level, right? And he's doing it on camera, and he's yeah. doing it where you're like zooming in, slowing it down. You still can't see it. Yeah, and it's way better in person. Oh, yeah. I can imagine. But it's just, it seems like I would never want to play cards with people because I I I get <laughs> fucked like unless I was yeah, like this covering yeah, my cards like a fucking person. yeah. There's no way to tell. No way. And, and a good cheat won't win. Oh, like a pool hustler. He'll have that person win. Oh. Yeah, a good cheat's not going to win. Oh. He'll lose every time. Mm, I go, that guy's a bad player. Let's have him again. <laughs> interesting. Like a pool hustler. Yeah. You lose a little bit, and the, then. You, no, you, you always lose. You miss once in a while, you win, but that guy wins. Oh, so that guy's your partner. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> So how does anybody not suspect him? Well, he, he wins just enough. You know, mm. it's not like a, an right. obvious thing. Like a pool hustler. Just yeah, in Vegas, behind every table, it says we have the right to refuse anybody for any reason. Because if they suspect that you're cheating somehow, they just boot you. Well, Vegas will do that even if you're not cheating. 
Which no, is even if you make two small bets and then one big bet, they're like, oh, watch that guy. Really? Yeah, of course. Yeah. What if you're just a psycho and just like, I feel like a big <laughs> bet's coming on. Pop yeah, it. but they don't need that. They, you know, Ooh. they need time. They need people who are going to play long and steady because that's how they make their money. Dana White is a crazy blackjack player. Like crazy. Like what, last time I saw him, we left. It was like two o'clock in the morning. He was down $600,000 playing blackjack. He won it all back and won 600000 Wow. He played till like 6 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, if you have the backing, like if you could back yeah. yourself over and over, mm -hmm. then that, that also helps. Meaning if, you yeah. don't, if you're not afraid to lose a certain amount of money because you know that you can keep backing yourself, yeah. that's a big advantage. But he's busted. I mean, he's gone. He's lost millions. In yeah, I'm sure. Like won millions as well. Yeah. But he's a real junkie. It's wild to watch. Like the crazy look they get in their eyes. <laughs> it's so terrifying because you like you see the numbers. Like, oh my god, this is so much money. Like, what are you doing? This but you is have so to insane. play. You have to play as though it, there's no money. You have mm. to play the exact way you would play if you were playing f for free. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. You have to. Well, I guess when you're as rich as he is, as well, like you really have to play for a lot of money just to get that juice to feel it. Like you for fifty bucks for him is nothing. It doesn't mean anything. Yeah. He has to play for fifty thousand. 50000 a hand is like, this is real money. Now we're playing real money. <laughs> and then when he wins, he's probably still like, oh, that wasn't enough. <laughs> you know, football player Taylor Lewin was with him, and uh, Taylor, he listens to Dana, and Dana, like, bets for him. And we were talking about it. We went to Shane Gillis's comedy show. And then afterwards, he's like, we're going to go bet with Dana White. We're going to go uh, gamble. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going. Let's go. I want to see this because these guys are psychos. And I always knew that Dana bet crazy numbers. So we went down there. And he was down $120,000 in the first five minutes. And I was like, oh, it was the anxiety. You're sitting there watching. It's, you're fucking freaking out. And then he won, and he was up 60000 and he quit. So I think he, I think he won like 65000 or something like that. But it's just like watching him down hundred and twenty thousand dollars in five minutes it's like oh my god my hands are clammy i'm like fuck this this is so crazy i got really lucky once at the what was it the palms mm -hmm. the fatitas the palms yeah. yeah so i was um i was filming my tv show and then at the end i was like oh let's go play some uh craps and they had a bet on the craps table which was called the fire bet and you have to open and close each number before you crap out Right? I don't so you, know how to play crap. So, so you have to hit like a four, freak. then you have to close a four before you get a seven, then you have to hit a five, then close a five, then a six, then an eight, then a nine, then a ten before you throw a seven. So it's very unlikely that you're going to do that with all of those numbers. So it's a great bet for the casino because nobody ever hits it. Right. And I was playing at the low stakes table, throwing the dice, but I, I said, oh, can I, can I throw dice? And they were like, no. And then... The pit boss, she called upstairs, uh, David Blaine wants to throw dice, can you give approval? And they said, yeah. So she said, okay, take your shirt off and joke, ha, ha, ha. And then, um, but yeah, pull your sleeves up, you can throw the dice and keep your hand, uh, you know, not out of the table. And I just, for the hell of it, put a bet down for everybody at the table, including the dealers. So I put like a bet that they would all win, I think like five grand or 10 grand if I hit. So I was throwing the dice, not, I didn't, nobody even, the fire bet never came out at the Palms, ever. And I was throwing the dice, and it was ours. And by the way, I think the Super Bowl champion table was over there, and they were all screaming, going crazy at the craps table next to us, the high stakes one, right? I kept throwing, and all of a sudden, the dealer says, I mean, the, the pit bull says, stop. And I was like, what? Because, you know, I was winning on hard eight and all these double fours, all these bets. Like, and they said, uh, you just hit the fire bet. And everybody at the table, I was like, what does that mean? They said, everybody at the table just won five or ten, I think 10,000. And all of a sudden, everybody started jumping up and down and going crazy. It was like pretty amazing. They had to stop the casino, that whole area. They shut down. They had to review for two hours to make sure I wasn't switching dice or doing anything funny. And then everybody had to fill out a W-9, and then everybody got paid. But it was pretty amazing. Did they and stop then you from playing? They or they let you keep playing? No, after that I was done. But they, it was two hours of dice roll. But then um, they removed that bet from the palms. I think that's what I was told. Wow.
Yeah, yeah I, I just got lucky. Trust you. I don't. No, believe I got you lucky. Right now. I don't fucking I, believe a word no, you're saying. I did. I promise. I got I lucky. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I'm telling you, it was like a. Yeah, uh, sure. You did. <laughs> I'm Damn telling it. you, sure you did. <laughs> uh, I did. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the problem with someone who's so good at sleight of hand. Like you could do things with cards in front of people, and they go, "No, he wasn't cheating. It was a spade, and then all of a sudden it was a diamond." But you obviously did do sleight of hand when you did that trick. Right? How do I know that you can't do that with dice? You surely could. Well, I can't, but there are people that can. Must be people I that can. I told you about last yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah, but, yeah. I, but not me. Because yeah. that's not your area of expertise. Yeah. Right? I mean, Cards. I don't spend 10 hours a day throwing dice against the crap stable. But if wall. you went to a card game, people would immediately be like, what? Is yeah, and as a magician, here? it's a lose lose. Because if, yeah. you, if you win, you cheated. And right. If you lose, you're a bad magician. So I just don't play. <laughs> <laughs> but I would be so tempted to just see if I could get away with it. Well, I did when I was like 18. Yeah. I would be see. so tempted just to like to see if I could get away with it under the scrutiny of all the cameras in Vegas. Not not trying to rip them off. If I would like to do it like say, hey, I'm going to rip you off. Please watch this. You don't have to give me the money. Yeah, you could do that. I would like to see that. But even just card camp, you know, people that count cards. They um, banned Dana White from the Palms because he won too much money playing blackjack. And so he pulled the UFC from the Palms. Really? Yeah. Was he counting cards? No. Just playing. Really? Yeah. He just won like $7 million in a night. Wow. You know, like, fuck you, you're banned. <laughs> Which is crazy because, like, if you lost $7 million, they'd be fine with it. They'd be thrilled. <laughs> but you can win $7 million and you can lose $7 million. I mean, But I was told most playing. casinos the profit is from slot machines. Oh, yeah, I heard that too. Yeah, <laughs> which is crazy because that's just rigged. <laughs> I mean, that's just a fucking computer. I mean, it's just tempting. you. But that's also this weird human instinct to just keep pressing the button and hoping it wins. Try it again. <laughs> Try it again. You know? I mean, it's not choice. It's not, you're not making decisions. You're just pressing buttons. You know what I mean? Yeah, like scratching six numbers. Yeah, it's, which is also super addictive. Yeah. Yeah. It's just so fascinating to me that people can do things right in front of your face and they tell you they're doing it. You still can't see it. You're like, what the fuck is happening here? Yeah. Well, that's you. <laughs> yeah. Well, the funny thing now, though, is it's very different because in the old days, not everybody had a, a video camera. Right. So you could just do whatever and not worry about the angles, this, that. Yeah. Now when you do magic, you have to be hypersensitive because everybody's filming from everywhere now. Right. So, you know, it changed the, the, the way you could perform. You have to be better. Not just better, but you have to think about things that you've never thought about because right. the human eye can't see it. You know, right. The human eye is worse than the first cell phone camera ever. It's just so low resolution. The image is upside down. You have a big optical nerve in the middle. So the eye doesn't really see. The brain paints a picture. But the right. video camera records, then you can see. And so if anybody's doing something that has a flaw, it's caught. Right. So it changes. It, it changed m magic a lot. But yet you could still do it. You just have yeah. To you just adjust. have to you have to think about all angles at all times and <sighs> be hyper aware so of everything from behind, from here, from here, from here, you know anything. What you do is so <laughs> interesting because you do that and then you do things like kissing cobras, which is like there's no trick there. That is not a trick. That well, is learning. I, but yeah, but learning from an expert that does yes. it over and over. So yeah. there is a technique to it. I'm just on a rush. Yeah, but it's yeah. not a trick. Like, you fucking kissed a cobra. It's not a rubber cobra. It's not. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like Two, by the way. Yikes. <laughs> Two different ones. Yeah. Listen, David, it's always a thrill to talk to you. You're a fucking amazing person, and uh, what you do is so fascinating to me. I don't want to learn it, but I'm so blown away. I want to end this podcast because I want you to show me how to count cards. <laughs> and uh, and tell me, when does this uh, show come out? Uh. Well, the, the National Geographic yes. series, I think it's in like six months or something. We're still filming episodes. Okay. Um, nothing as dangerous as the kissing the cobra anymore, hopefully. And yeah, I, I think it'll be, I think it's interesting. Well, just the clips you show me are amazing. It's crazy. <laughs> Which, I mean, I don't want to give it all away, but you showed me a lot of wild shit and it's fucking insane. And please tell me when it comes out. By the out. way, you didn't come see my show. 
I didn't come see your show. I didn't know when it was. In Vegas. Well, you didn't tell me. Well, you have to come at one well, point. Well, when is it? It's at the win, and you have to see it. When is it? How often do you do it? Uh, it's only like a few days a month, because it's, it's, it has this magic and everything in it, but it has the physical stuff as well, so I can't overdo it. But that show isn't going to last for a long time, because physically it's not possible, so you really should come see I it. I will. When are you doing it again? Uh, are you there on November, December 15th? No, it's like end of the month always it's, end of the month yeah but it's a few days per month so you, you okay you should really see it you tell okay there it is it's, <laughs> it's up there so i will figure out when i can get to vegas and i will do it yes please. i'll try to do it in line but with it's a the, show that i can't keep doing for much longer I'm so sure. i really would love it if you did come god i hope mean, i don't go to one where you get hurt it's very possible. I don't want that. I no, but to get her like yeah, you. I know, but, but I know, but that's the part. That's the stuff that keeps I will me come. Okay. We'll, we'll figure it out, and I will come. Okay, so then I'll, then we'll discuss this. Okay, all right. All right thank, thank you, brother. Thank Appreciate you. you very much. Thank you. Bro. My pleasure. All right, bye, everybody.